Hello, Hal. Hello. And Jim, excellent. Hey, just in time. <laughs> so let's let's call to order. It's 6 p.m. on Monday, December 7th. Um, call to order the regular meeting of the Winooski City Council. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance led by Deputy Mayor Hal Colston. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which, for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, agenda review is up next. Any concerns about the order of our agenda? All right. So now we are at public comment. This is a chance for members of the public who wish to speak to any issues that are not included in the agenda. If you are here for something that is on the agenda, I ask that you please hold for that item to come up. Um, I believe we do have at least one public comment this evening. We do. Uh, we have Dylan Lovell. Dylan, whenever you are ready. Hey, how's it going? Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah, welcome. Hey, thanks. Uh, so I'm Vermont resident and I recently purchased uh, Waft Deli over on East oh. Allen Street uh, with a few other folks. And we're not sure exactly what we want to do with it yet. Um, but one thing that uh, I'm hoping we can uh, start to bring attention to, and I'm not sure if you guys have discussed this at other meetings, but uh, S54, um, the legalize uh, tax and regulate bill for cannabis. Yep. The opt-in clause. Uh, so I just wanted to, um, I guess, just get that on the agenda on the next uh, town meeting. Yeah, so that is something that we have been discussing. I think we're waiting for some guidance from the state on how exactly to do that. Um, Jesse, would you like to chime in? Hi, Dylan, I'm Jesse, I'm the city manager. Um, yes, we have been tracking this issue and um, know that local action is needed or needs to be considered. Um, we, are hopeful, we are hoping that there will be additional guidance coming from the state or the Cannabis Commission on what that um, ballot item should look like. Um, and we have about a month and a half to finalize that before it needs to be voted on to the town meeting day ballot. All right, awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the reminder. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have for, uh, any other public comment? Nobody else signed up officially, but folks can raise their hand if they want or indicate in the chat. All right, we will then move to our consent agenda. Um, we have two items on for approval. We have our council minutes from November 2nd um, and amended minutes from June 1. Was anyone not present for either of those meetings? I don't think so. Okay, um, and then we also have our accounts payable warrant, um, 11-17 and 12-3 and payroll warrant for period 1018 to 1031, 94 to 1114, and period 1115 to 1128, and subsequent to payout for September. Are there any questions or concerns on the consent agenda? I would entertain a motion to approve both items. That moved. Second. Second. Motion by Jim, second by Mike. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries, thank you. So we are now at council reports. Uh, can I start with Mike this evening? Sure. Uh, Municipal Infrastructure Committee, our commission had a meeting last week and we discussed um, a, a few things. We discussed our tree inventory with the tree committee and Councillor Duncan, you can jump in at any time um, through my report because you're there and you're part of the tree committee as well. 
Um, and I think you know the information a little bit more than I do, but I'll put my take on it. Um, we met with some with several UVM students that had a project to map out the priority of tree planting for the city of Winooski. And their presentation was um, very well done, very detailed. And I think there's a couple minor things that need to be adjusted on it. I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Jim. Um, but I think it was a worthy presentation that should be done in front of the council. So not only Jim and I know um, the information on this presentation, but I think it'd be good for the public to know as well. Um, they discussed some of the tree inventory um, and the needs in the areas that we don't have that many public trees. Um, they went through a lot of information. I think a little bit too much for me to discuss here tonight right now. Um, we also discussed the tree inventory and out of 870 public managed trees, 68% of them are in good condition. 11% um, of them are in fair condition, 5% are in poor condition. Um, so there's, I think there's some room for improvement here in our public trees. Um, and then we got into the parking study just a little bit but not enough to warrant a conversation tonight. Um, there is a link that I can share with the, my fellow counselors, if you'd like, on the cover sheet of that. And stay tuned for more information on the parking study from the Municipal Infrastructure Committee. Did I miss anything, Jim? No, that's great, Mike, thanks. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You, Mike, you might um, work with your commission chair to write a municipal infrastructure update that we could share publicly with the presentation and the parking study link and all that. Um, why don't we move then to Jim for his updates? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, so in the past, uh, since we last met, I have attended the uh, Housing Commission meeting. We received another update on housing stability indicators, which I know um, Heather will be covering later. Um, so the short version of that is that we still are not seeing um, significant signs of concern at this point. And we also were able to talk with a couple of landlords in the city to get their um, their take and story on uh, what they've been experiencing with rent non-payments. So that was really helpful to have multiple lines of uh, information at that commission meeting. And the commission also discussed um, some priorities for advocating at the uh, convening of housing commissions, which Heather, I don't know if you'll be touching on this in city updates or not. Um, so I'll just say briefly, the housing commission uh, convening Convening of Housing Commissions in Chittenden County happened. I attended that as well, where they discussed uh, recent legislation around accessory dwelling units and potential legislation around a statewide rental registry, um, discussing how cities like Winooski have uh, seen a lot of value out of this and how as a statewide model, it could be potentially beneficial. Um, I also attended the Municipal Infrastructure Commission meeting, as Mike said. Um, I think you covered it all well, Mike, and I'm looking forward to working with the students a little bit more on revising that prioritization plan and seeing if the commission will uh, take any further action on it. And then finally, um, so it's almost uh, the new year and town meeting day is coming up. So I wanted to uh, say I've been really grateful to work with this group and this team at the city. Um, and I'm looking forward to running again for a city council seat in March. So I will be uh, initiating more work on that, but I, I'm hoping that I can uh, work with my fellow counselors and with residents to uh, continue to serve Winooski in this capacity. Thank you. Um, excited to have you run again. Um, how would you like to go next? Sure. Um, I just first want to note that um, Councillor Duncan and I have on the same shirt, which is kind of very interesting. So I'll let that speak for itself. Um, the only thing I have to report is that I have made um, a connection with the Legislative Council um, at the uh, General Assembly and um, um, offered our proposal for the charter change. So that is being um, turned into a bill, um, which I will share with the mayor and the city manager just to see the draft and see what you think. And I think there will be a memo that comes out with it as well. 
um, offering ledge council's um, opinions on um, what we're asking to do. So I'll, uh, I should get something back in the next few days and I will forward that to the mayor and to the city manager. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Amy. Hi, uh, I feel like I have a lot of updates, so please bear with me because it's been a little while since we've met. Um, first, I want to say thank you to Matt Gust Gustafson, um, who not only purchased, but went to the Dismas house and cooked them a full Thanksgiving meal two weeks ago. Nice. Um, according to a Facebook post that the Dismas house put up, they were very moved and appreciative of this gesture by Matt. So I just wanted to give him um, a shout out and say thank you. And I also wanted to thank Papa Frank's and our house for contributing items to that meal. Um, and just also acknowledge their generosity as restaurants. Um, you know, all restaurants are struggling right now and I just thought it was really wonderful that they were able to pitch in as well. Uh, also last month, I attended the downtown Winooski um, November meeting. And during that meeting, Downtown Winooski voted to bring on three new board members. They are Allie Nagel, of course, of the Monkey House and Waking Windows. That we all know Allie pretty well. Um, Jackie DeJess of the DeJess Company. And she was actually once a former Downtown Winooski board member. She'll be coming back. And David Rose of Twincraft. Um, so... These are great for downtown Winooski, these folks coming on, not only because they represent a number of different types of businesses, but they're also spread out businesses throughout our city, um, which I think just helps drive home the fact that downtown Winooski really is for all businesses, not just the ones in the downtown core. Um, one other piece about downtown Winooski I wanted to remind folks about is that they are having their holiday pop-up shop. It's virtual this year, and that's happening right now through December 13th. Um, you can visit their website, downtownwinooski.org, to shop for gifts from local vendors. Um, and many of those vendors are also offering a local pickup option, so you don't have to pay for shipping. So again, that's downtownwinooski.org. Um, and also in November, I attended the Safe, Healthy, Connected People Commission, and the commission spent the majority of the meeting reviewing their goals from the master plan. And in general, they're feeling good about the progress that they were able to make so far, um, considering that they were able to pass things like the Parks and Open Space Master Plan. The group saw that as a big win um, in such a short amount of time. But the group also recognized that we have a, a large number of kind of bigger lofty goals that are going to take creative thinking and collaboration to accomplish things like housing solutions and food insecurity and addressing healthcare needs for people in our city. So the commission is continuing to think about ways to tackle those moving forward and how they can collaborate with other groups to accomplish that. Um, and finally, as Jim alluded to, we're approaching town meeting day, and um, I wanted to share that my city council term will be expiring in March, and I will not be seeking re-election. Thanks, Amy. Um, uh, so when we move to city updates after this, um, I've asked our city manager to share a little more detail on the process for town meeting day if there are folks interested in running for any of these open terms. Um, my term is also expiring on town meeting day and I plan to run for re-election to also continue working with this group and with this community to, to move us forward. Um, one really big announcement I would like to start with is that we have been working for quite some time towards a large grant opportunity, the Working Communities Challenge Grant. And Winooski was awarded this grant, um, $300,000 over three years to help us implement the community-driven vision for building more equity in our city. Um, so really thankful to staff for working on that grant opportunity, to you know, folks here at the council table for contributing to that, and to a ton of community members. A lot of work went into securing that resource and will really set us up to, like, resource this work and kick it off in a good way. So more to come on that. Um, I attended Finance and Planning Commission meetings last since I last meeting. They both met, both spent time discussing master plan progress. 
um, for their strategic vision area. I think at our next meeting, we'll look at the results from all of the commissions and then have a discussion overall about our master plan progress. The planning commission also started to discuss changes to accessory dwelling unit. Um, Jim mentioned that this legislation popped up at the housing convening and there are some small adjustments that we will likely need to make locally to adapt to the state guidance. Um, I think at our next, the next planning commission meeting this week, we will be talking about a, a schedule to move us forward and when these actual changes and recommendations will go to public hearing um, as they progress towards eventually happening. I attended the monthly airport advisory commission meeting um, on that agenda was the consideration of the addition of a voting seat for a Winooski representative on that commission. I think the discussion went well. I participated and advocated for us. That item is, I believe, on Burlington City Council's agenda tonight as they are considering adding it to their town meeting day ballot. So we should know tomorrow if that's moving, well, potentially if that's moving forward. Um, and then finally, Heather, our Community and Economic Development Officer, and myself joined the Winooski, Winooski Housing Authority um, Board just to sort of share about the city's housing goals from our master plan and hear a little bit from them to try to make sure that we are coordinating as we move forward housing affordability in our community. Um, that's it for me. I will pass it to you, Jesse. Oh, Mike, you have a question? Adele, I have one more thing that I forgot to mention about our infrastructure meeting. Uh, because we're part of the Tree USA, it's opening doors for grants. And we're going to be speaking about one of those later on in our agenda about the TD green space. So because of us, in, um, correct me if I'm wrong again, Jim, because of your help getting us part of being of Tree USA, it's opening grants and, and monies for us to help our green spaces out. When you, when you started talking about the other grant, it just popped in my head, so. No problem, thanks, Mike. I think Jim forgot something too. Apparently, I hope uh, Hal and Amy won't leave me and Mike high and dry here. Um, I just, I did attend, I realize it's been a long time since we talked, I have attended a couple of board meetings of the Heart of Winooski Foundation, which was formed uh, to solicit and utilize donations for the Winooski School District Capital Improvement Project. And they were announced, they announced this uh, month, the acceptance of a $100,000 lead gift to the district for um, capital improvement. So um, I just wanted to amplify and, and reshare that news here. Um, the full board is meeting on Thursday for the first time. So we'll have our full complement of members, including community and parent representatives. Um, so really great uh, start for Winooski and really appreciative of the donor who stepped up and um, has stepped into this district funding. So I just wanted to share that piece too. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now we'll move to city updates. Great, thank you. Um, so let me start with town meeting day. I'm excited on behalf of staff, excited that Councillor Duncan and Mayor Lott will be running again and Amy, we will miss you very much, um, but know you will stay involved in lots of other ways. So brace yourself for those requests. Um, so if people are watching now um, and interested in uh, running for office on town meeting day, um, you need to, the process is to come into the city clerk's office, uh, meet with one, either, either Carol, the city clerk, or one of the assistant city clerks, and sign a consent to appear on the ballot. Um, with the COVID legislation, signatures are not needed to run for office this year. Um, so that consent to have your name appear on the ballot needs to be signed no later than January 25th at 5 p.m. Um, so we will remind folks again, but that is the process for running, for getting your name on the ballot this year. And just as a reminder to the community, the city clerk's office is currently open between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. Monday through Friday. Um, so along the elections line and along the lines of we haven't met in a while, uh, the day after our last council meeting was election day, uh, we broke several records here in the city with 3,734 people voting, 1,400 more people than voted on town meeting day this year. 
Um, so a great turnout and really um, exceptional work done by our city clerks, not only to process the uh, mail-in ballots, but also to um, staff a very busy election day on, on election day on November 3rd. Um, also really wanna thank all of our neighbors who came out to vote on election day um, for their uh, patience and compliance with all the safety protocols that were in place. So it certainly felt a little different, but everyone was very cooperative and we really appreciate that. Um, I wanna give you a couple of uh, additional COVID related updates. Um, so we did wanna do one last reminder about the um, COVID utility arrearage program that's being offered by the state. This is for utility bills where people are have outstanding balances. Um, you have to, um, these balances ha are only for after March 1st and they have to be 60 days past due. So it's really for uh, past due amounts between March 1st and this fall. The deadline is December 15th. So we wanted to bring it to everyone's attention again. Um, we have, we are participating as a city in the program and we have had five properties apply thus far. But if there's anyone else who is interested, um, we sent out a stuffer with the last your last utility bill with the information about how to apply on it. So you can refer to that document um, or go to our website to learn more. Um, additionally, on the COVID front, um, you hopefully have seen that we, as of today, have partnered with uh, the Vermont Department of Health, CIC Health, and a number of community partners to start um, daily COVID testing in Winooski for the foreseeable future. This is, I will say, pending a future vote of yours later on tonight to use the space, but we are assuming that you will allow us to do that. Um, so this will be daily testing at the O'Brien Community Center. Um, this week, the hours are during the day. Um, we hope it, in future weeks to have weekend and evening hours as well. Um, I do wanna make a point that this is a, um, what they are calling observed, nasal, na <laughs> observed na nasal swab testing. So basically it is a self-administered test that a healthcare professional watches you do to ensure that it's a, a good test. Um, and it's not quite as invasive as the past tests have been. Mm -hmm. Um, there are many materials that are translated both about the hours of operation and the process that people will experience when they go to the testing site that are available um, on our website, but also through um, many of our community partners. Um, people can sign up on the VDH website to test. They can also walk in. There will be walk-in availability every day. Um, there will also be translators on site um, every day the Winooski site is up. Um, and I do, so I think this is a great opportunity for our community to continue to keep ourselves safe and, and healthy. Um, I do wanna take a moment to especially thank our partner, our caseworkers um, and the interpretation coordinators at ALV and USCRI. They have done an enormous amount of work in the last two weeks to partner with us in CIC Health to stand this up and get materials available um, in all the languages that um, our neighbors speak. So huge thanks, huge shout out and thanks to ALV and USCRI. Ray, is there anything else on testing you wanna, Ray has been coordinating this, the OCC, anything else you wanna? No, I think you got it. They, uh, they were there this afternoon and dropped all their materials off. So we're, we're ready to roll tomorrow morning. Great, thank you. Um, one last sort of COVID related thing, you hopefully saw the announcement that the Winooski Memorial Library has now opened again for in, uh, by appointment service. So folks can go in and look at the shelves. Um, their browse and borrow sessions are half an hour. You can register on uh, the website or by calling 655-6424, um, 6424. Um, and that they have appointments Wednesday through Friday or Saturday each week. So Wednesday through Saturday each week. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of other non-COVID updates. Um, we did have our TIF um, annual monitoring visit um, right after Thanksgiving. It went very well. Angela and I participated in that and Angela and Heather are currently working on our annual reporting. Um, the TIF visit involved the state staff as well as members of their policy board. Um, and all, by all accounts, we are um, 
doing well and on track to retire our debt. And we'll be talking about that in a future agenda item as well. Um, like many other communities, we are also um, concerned about our plowing operations this winter if we are to have a COVID impact on staff. Um, so we are monitoring that very closely and working with our um, neighbors, as you likely know, for us to plow the streets. We really, in a big storm, we need all of our CDL licensed drivers available. So if we are down one or two, we may see an impact on operations and are prepared to um, address that as we see it. Um, and then finally, and Chief Audie jump in here, um, you received a few messages from me at the end of last week about the sprinkler break at um, 65 Winooski Falls Way. This is one of the Keynes Crossing buildings. So I wanna give you a quick update on that. Um, so we have had about 60 families, about 110 individuals relocated as a result of that sprinkler break. Um, basically there was a significant amount of water in the building that got into the electrical system and really shut down the building. Um, those families have all been relocated to hotels in the area paid for by um, Hall Keen, the, the property manager. Um, Ray worked with Chief Audi and the state and the school and many other partners to ensure that those families all had um, access to food over the weekend at their hotel and that those systems are in place through the beginning of this week as well. It is our hope that the majority, the vast majority of those families will be able to return this week once the um, electrical system is back, fully back online. Um, there is likely a few units that will um, need to be displaced for a longer period of time. Um, we do believe that both, both businesses in the uh, property, both Commodities and Schaefer's Deli are back open. Um, finally, it is a very, you probably, this probably sounds very familiar to you. There was a very similar sprinkler break in a different Keynes Crossing building earlier this year. Uh, so Chief Audie and the state inspectors are looking at um, the products used in the building and seeing if there is a more systematic problem that we need to look at and address over time. There are two more buildings that have not experienced this break currently in the Keynes Crossing or um, uh, development. So Chief, is there anything else on that that I missed that you wanna highlight? No, I think you nailed it. And again, just thank you to all of our partners for you know Keens Crossing, their management staff, Ray, you know, uh, the city manager, the state emergency management folks, um, you know, the PD, there's several folks that played a role and uh, you know, we, there's a lot for people to be displaced um, during normal, normal times. So we tried to express that to the residents of, um, you know, we don't take lightly um, and, and really try to acknowledge their hardships. Um, so we're working as diligent as we can to make sure they can get back in their homes um, as quickly as possible um, with safe conditions. And we'll do our part to look at the product issues and, and see if there's a bigger problem. Thanks. And that's all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, moving to our regular items. First item on the agenda A is for discussion. This is about the local petition process for town meeting day. So while COVID legislation did specifically outline a change in process for candidates to get on the town meeting day ballot, it did not specifically address petition ballot items. So while we are able to put items on the ballot, residents can also petition to do so. And the current state statute requires 5% of registered voters signatures to add an item to the ballot on annual meeting, town meeting day. In light of the public health crisis, I am recommending that we sort of create our own policy without having one coming from the state on this to say that we would accept electronic signatures. Um, so this could be in the form of an actual electronic petition or like a Google form or something like that with the stipulation that the actual ballot language be included and that the 5% um, signature minimum is still met. So that aligns to the, you know, sort of in-person signature process. Um, there is also a, in the state statute, 
a due date for that sort of petition set at 47 days before town meeting day. Um, and I spoke with staff about this. So we are on our January 25th meeting, finalizing our warning for the town meeting day ballot. And so would set our own due date for any sort of resident petition to the 21st so that the clerk's office has time to, to review that and add it to the warning. Um, I put this on here as a discussion tonight. I think what we are discussing is, is this a suitable process to say that residents can put something on the town meeting day ballot? Um, is this a suitable alternative for our pandemic status? And if so, would we want to take a vote on it at our next meeting? So I will stop there for questions. I have a question, Mayor. Sure. Would this be just during the times of pandemic or would this be the way it would work from here on out if this does go, if we do pass this? This is specific, what I'm discussing is us taking an action specific to town meeting day 2021. So, okay, so just 2021 and then, mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Oh, Jesse, did you want to jump in? I just wanted to jump in with a quick point of clarification. Everything you said is correct. The um, January 14th deadline for normal petition processes is to allow the city clerk to assess whether those who have signed petitions are legal voters of Winooski. In this particular case, it's a little different because you're using the petitions as, uh, you would be using the petitions as a um, kind of a data source for you all to make your decision. Um, so I would suggest if if you approve this and people move forward with it, that they do try and get their petitions in as early as possible in case they're not registered voters on that list. Uh, we can still work to bring those or the petition um, holders can still work to bring those to you with the appropriate registered voters. Thank you. It's a good flag. Um, Amy, I see your hand is raised. Yeah, that was actually along the lines of what I was going to ask, Jesse. So thanks for clarifying that. Um, I think that this process definitely makes a lot of sense given the pandemic that we're in. I'm just wondering, and, and it doesn't sound like it, but I just want to verify that this process wouldn't at, be any sort of additional burden to the city clerk. It, it would just be kind of the same process that she would verify signatures in the past, but just electronic. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, thanks. Jim. Uh, thank you. I So I just want to clarify, because my understanding is the petition being circulated right now doesn't include street addresses. Um, so mm. is it going to be possible to verify? I guess the question I have maybe for the council first, and then the, depending on the answer to Jesse and the city staff, is that is whether the registered voter piece is um, is a requirement. So does a person have to be a registered voter in the city of Winooski in order for us to um, basically take action if we reach that threshold or are we willing to go with any person who is a resident of Winooski because right now I, I just don't know and so if the answer is we want it to be registered then to, to Jesse is that feasible with just a zip code and a first and a last name so do you want me <laughs> my recommendation would be yes we do want them to be registered voters yes. I would like us to be able to accept name like match the name to the, the voter registration list, but definitely Jesse would like to hear your thoughts. Um, so in normal times, there's two different ways to get a ballot item on the town meeting day ballot. There is the petition process, which is the formal in-person signatures with street addresses that are submitted 47 days in advance, go through if petition, get on the ballot. The council always reserves the right to put whatever they want onto the ballot. So you all can always make an exception and decide to put something on the ballot. Basically, this is a, um, what the mayor has outlined is a proposal to, um, not, to not require the petition process in times of COVID, but still have a data source for you all to advise you on what to move forward onto the ballot. So that so the signatures that we would be verifying electronically, we would still, per the what the mayor has outlined, 
we would still be looking for registered Winooski voters on of that list and providing you data on what came, what was on the, that petition that was presented. We can search, um, and Carol jump in here, but we can search the voter registration list by name only. Um, so we will do our best to verify those names without street addresses. It's a little harder to determine um, the validity of that data, but it is feasible to think that uh, we would be able to search by name. Jesse? Yes, Carol. Also, the names would have to be legible yeah. in order for us to, you know, confirm the name. Um, if they could either uh, print their name and then sign their name would be helpful also. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a good point of clarification is this is like a policy that we are commit would be committing to as a group and that we're going to take this, uh, this similar process and say if these standards are met, we would vote to put this item onto a ballot. Jim, is your hand raised again? New question. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I, I, I think this is the right move. I think that we shouldn't be forcing people into other people's houses to gather signatures at a time. I realize we're making kind of a strange pre-commitment to put things on the ballot, but um, I think that if the city can accommodate the additional work of verifying those names as best we can, and we can get a report if there are any unsure um, numbers. So if we're close, but not quite there, but there's 10 people you can't match to a registered voter, but they say they're from Winooski, I think we should hear that information too. Um, but I do think that this is, uh, it's a it's a reasonable response and we get the same level of um, support that we would have gotten through a paper signature drive. So while we can't get that relief from the legislature, I'm I'm hopeful that we can do that as a city. Any other questions or comments from council? So I would turn to the public. I see we do have a hand raised. So Carol Montague, when you are ready, go ahead. Hi, um, thanks for considering this. Um, I just wanna be, when it, whatever you decide, I just want it to have it be very clear um, the process. So, um, the question around the need of addresses or not having addresses, or, um, if just a zip code is, is okay. Um, just to have that be, um, very clear <laughs> for the, for, for people who are trying to get a resolution on the ballot. Sure. So it's, it's my understanding that in certain online petition, um, platforms, you cannot collect a street address. And so we would be asking our city clerk's office to compare name. So if somebody has put in their name and zip code to mm -hmm. compare that to our voter registration list, um, if they can find that name on the registered voters list, then we as council could say, I think that counts as a registered voter signature. Mm -hmm. um, but the point that was made earlier is just to call out that it's not it's not as verifiable as maybe the state process would be, but that we are agreeing that this works for us for this upcoming um, town meeting day vote. Okay, so what is that? What is that saying? If there are sort of questions around, there's there's a name. They say they live in Winooski, but they're not found found to be a registered voter. Is that something that would come back to? the people running the petition and we would get a list and say, can you verify that these are registered voters? Jesse, go ahead. So uh, yes, Kara, I think how it typically works is that when petitions are filed um, about two weeks before they're due to the council and the city clerk commits to turning them within, within tw turning them around within 24 or 48 hours if there are not enough registered voters on the list, so if that petition was received in time um, to, for the city clerk to do that work, we would certainly turn that around to the uh, petition submitters if there weren't enough 
uh, folks who we could find on our Winooski voter registration list. Okay. And is, um, I, I am not totally sure about the dates of two weeks ahead and um, is that gonna be written down somewhere, that process? Yeah, so this item is just on our agenda this evening for discussion. Mm -hmm. We will actually take a vote at our next meeting in which this will be outlined. If, and it sounds like the body is moving towards wanting to see this come back at the next, the next meeting. Okay, and that would outline the full process and the timeline? Correct, yes. For when signatures would need to be submitted. Okay. Yes. And when is the next meeting? Next Monday. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have another hand raised. All right, Marguerite, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much to, to the council members for helping to clarify this process for us. Now, I just wanted to report that at this point, the online petition has 346 signatures, um, but I haven't been able to uh, get an uh, aggregated list by uh, area codes, zip codes, um, so that I can see how many are actually Winooski. But out of curiosity, would it be helpful to the clerks if we were able to alphabetize the list uh, by, first, by last name to make it easier to go through the voter rolls? And so that's just my question for you. If we could do that, we would certainly do that. It doesn't matter. It it doesn't matter. We just enter the name in, and, and if they're a registered voter in the city of Winooski, it will pop up. Got it. Okay. I appreciate you looking out, though, for helping make it easier for staff. Are there any other questions or comments? All right. So I will, we will bring this back at our meeting next week and take an official vote. Um, oh, Jim. Sorry, I was waiting for members of the public. Um, so just to be clear, we are requiring at this point a separate first name, last name, zip code, and that's all that we need on the petition, right? Or that we would require from the petition, just to make it clear yes. like what level of information. Because I noticed, Carol, you said you have emails and zip codes, but Marguerite, it makes you sound, you make it sound like we have names as well. So just wanna make sure we have those. Oh, we definitely need names, not just yeah. emails. And I thought that from what Marguerite said that we do have, there will be names on the, um, any of the petition that they're working on. So any petition would have to have the first name, the last name, email, zip code. That is correct. Great, thank you. Um, so just to clarify, so I know what we're potentially writing up for next week. Yes, that's the data we will collect and we will compare it to the voter registration. So the intent of the council is that you are interested in that 5% of registered voters number. That's right. Um, so we will do our best to circulate back to folks who have submitted a petition if they haven't met that threshold. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, so we will revisit this next, I'm sorry, I see another hand up. Yeah, um, James, whenever you are ready. I just heard the word email, and I just wanted to alert you that although you put your email address in on, a ch on this kind of change.org petition, they won't give it back to you. They will give you the full name and the and the zip code, but not the email address, even though you put it in. Oh, I do, we're not require, going to require email. That's not okay. information in the voter Terrific. registration anyway. So sorry for the confusion. Yeah. Um, yes. Unusual times require a new and unusual process. Um, so we will see this outlined in text at our next meeting. We can take an official vote and that will be available to any residents who um, would like to, to petition for a ballot item this, this town meeting day. Any other questions or comments? 
All right. We will move then to our next item B. This is on for approval. This is downtown to go parking, which Heather will introduce. Good evening. Um, I am just here to do the introduction piece of this. Uh, we're bringing forward a request from downtown Winooski on behalf of the downtown businesses for seven of our on-street parking spaces to be designated to go parking spaces to facilitate curbside pickup. Um, so these would be 15 minute parking spaces specifically for to go pickup. Um, and there is a map included in your materials and as well as a memo from Meredith. And this request is coming out of, I think it was six or seven meetings that we had with businesses, um, Meredith and myself, March and throughout the summer, really looking for ways that the city and downtown Winooski could best support our businesses to be successful in these difficult times. So this is a temporary request that would go from the time of your approval until June 30th of 2021. And we've selected June 30th because there's some possibility that people will be vaccinated by that point in time, but there's certainly a possibility that people can go back to outdoor dining at that time. So we really just need to help carry the businesses through the winter months. There is an associated cost to that, which would be a little under $15,000 in foregone revenue um, at 100% use of those parking spaces. Um, but I think that it's easy to argue you that keeping our businesses afloat will have a far greater economic impact on the city than that $15,000. So I'm going to turn it over to Meredith to add anything that she would like to add um, and go over her memo with you a little bit. Meredith, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here, I promise. Um, thank you so much, Heather. So she really said it. I don't really have a lot to add, except that this, you know, we... Heather and myself and um, in talking with other downtowns in Vermont and beyond at the beginning of the pandemic and throughout, we've had a lot of ideas. And quite frankly, a lot of them have been put aside by businesses. And this is an idea that really came to a consensus with a lot of businesses that came together. Um, and we even got um, a lot of businesses that aren't restaurants that don't necessarily need to go 15 minute spots to weigh in on this. Um, and the approval was overwhelming. So this is one of those things that we just can't ignore because um, it, it has consensus among business owners um, in the downtown area that these parking spots are going to be located in, um, but also the pretty much the entire business community, um, just because this is one of those things that they um, themselves came up with, um, with our, with our, during our discussion. So I'm happy to walk through any of the information that we provided, um, but I think it's pretty straightforward. Well, thank you both for continuing to liaise with our business community and work with them to find creative ways to help support them. Um, you know, this is an unprecedented situation and we are all trying to be creative and, and find ways to get through. Um, I personally think this is a no brainer. Um, <laughs> Based on the information that you have shared, are there any questions or concerns from council? Mike has his hand raised. Hello, um, I have a couple questions. Now I've noticed on the map that the mill area and the Winooski block areas have not designated any 15 to go parking spots. Were they in on the conversations or it, can you explain why it's just in that one area where, where you designated them? Part of it is they were part of those discussions. Part of it is that this is quite frankly, a pilot, just like everything is in the pandemic. Um, and part of it is because there are some significant blocks of 15 minute courtesy spaces already in those areas. Um, if this becomes something that the, uh, that both consumers, uh, the customers and the businesses are really finding, wow, that is actually making a huge impact more than we even anticipated, then we would certainly um, come back to council with additional requests because I think that um, you're right, we are concentrating these in one area. Um, but if it, if it turns out that this is something that needs to, that people want to expand, we would come back with more requests. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking of the delis and the coffee shops might be interested in having those, those easy pickups. Yep. Um, Okay, thank you. 
Anyone else? Any uh, public comments on this topic? As a reminder, you can raise your hand or use the chat in Zoom. All right, so I would entertain a motion to approve the downtown to-go parking. So moved. Second. Motion by Hal, second by Jim. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Um, item C, our proposed FY22 budget overview and general government review discussion begins. Okay, okay give me a quick second to set up the sharing. All right, are people seeing the um, slide? Great. I Thank you. Um, so thank you very much for um, this next step in the FY22 proposed budget process. Um, tonight, I am going to share with you a presentation about um, the overview, the budget, the total budget overview, as well as the overview of the general government operations. Um, I also want would be remiss if I did not start with a thanks to the entire leadership team that is on um, the Zoom tonight. So this is I have the privilege of presenting the work, but it is really work that they all have done um, over the course of the last couple of months, uh, putting together these budget proposals. Um, so um, I, I will walk through this presentation. The real um, you know, goal of tonight is to give you that big picture of what's going to be before you over the next six meetings, um, to hear any questions you may have and request for information you may have, so we can be best prepared for the future budget presentations. Obviously, you can always ask us additional questions or for additional information as we go through this process. Um, tonight, what I am sharing is the actual um, presentation, but we have provided the full budget book linked to your agenda today. Um, Paul has also built out the website www.winooskivt.gov backslash FY22 with the full budget book in its entirety, as well as broken out by individual sections in the hopes that that may be slightly easier to navigate to for uh, residents as they follow along with our process over the next several months. Um, so those are my introductory points. Um, so this is what I'm gonna talk about tonight. Um, again, the overview, um, general funds, all funds, and then what your task, what the questions will be before you, um, and then an overview of the general government operations as well. So typically I start these presentations annually with um, our strategic vision and all of our accomplishments in the last year to achieve the strategic vision. Um, you have those monthly reports from us. We've been providing those um, regularly throughout the pandemic. We will provide you another report number four tonight. Um, and those are available on our website. So I am not gonna spend a lot of time tonight walking through those strategic vision areas because quite frankly, as we all know, this year has been very different. Um, so I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about how this year has been different um, and what that means for our community as we think about FY22, which again, won't start until July 1st, 2021. Um, so this year, um, as the world did, we experienced the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, during that time, we ensured that the public safety has, was and has been maintained uh, without stop. We maintained our essential infrastructure and services. We sent out hundreds of communications to our residents, um, both in English and in other languages, sharing information from the state and other experts. Uh, we had 20, we furloughed 21 staff to protect the finances of the city. We stood up weekly and now bi-weekly Winooski leadership briefing meetings with um, housing leaders, faith leaders, nonprofit leaders, business leaders from across the city to ensure that we were all had the same information on the same page that we could share resources if needed and we're making the best decisions we could in the interest of the residents. Um, and finally, we responded to the Winooski Burlington outbreak over the summer uh, very quickly and were able to con uh, contain that outbreak with the partnership of USCRI, ALV, and the health department. And we were so thankful that through that outbreak, 
we did not lose any of our neighbors. So what does that mean for the future? Um, so I believe, and I think our leadership team believes that um, with that work and with the continued focus on our shared strategic vision work plan, we are actually well poised to come out of the pandemic um, as strong as ever. So on the city side, we've maintained our work on our significant development projects. As you know, we finished construction on Myers Memorial Pool and you've heard regular um, updates on our other infrastructure projects. We've continued to work with private developers as we continue to see investment in Winooski um, from other housing and commercial developers. Uh, all staff were brought back from furlough at the very beginning of August when the um, additional unemployment bonus expired. Um, so we are fortunate that we have all of our team members back and uh, fully working for us, some remote. Um, as, as we speak. Um, and we have been very thankful that that team has continued to follow, that our full team has continued to follow the safety guidance with temperature checks and mask masking and staying socially distant. Um, and so far have meet, been able to maintain a healthy team. During the pandemic, we hired 15 exceptional new staff people, um, really were able to recruit some pretty extraordinary talent into the city and are really poised to take off um, with service delivery once we're able to fully open up again. We've also, Angela has done an enormous amount of work to go after every COVID um, funding opportunity available, not only for municipal operations, but for our residents. Uh, we've applied for FEMA, a FEMA grant, an elders grant. Um, Kate Anderson, our Thrive Director, has been exceptional bringing in funding to support our um, after school and summer programming. Um, really hoping to again ensure we maintain the fiscal health of the city. We've strengthened um, community connections with or community partnerships with our community partners that I think will last long beyond the pandemic. And hopefully we've been able to build trust with our neighbors. So this budget looks different from past budgets and I wanna kind of paint a bigger picture of why that's true. So as most of you know and have been involved in, we have been on a multi-year journey long before I was here um, to envision what our community could be starting with the tax increment financing district, really up to the adoption of the strategic vision in 2015. Um, since 2015 and that adoption, we have gone through a, a several year cycle of um, planning and making commitments to one another through all of the different master plans and um, associated documents that we spent hundreds of hours of community time building. Uh, we have taken three significant bond votes to strengthen the infrastructure in our community, including the pool, Main Street, and the development of the Abenaki Garage. And now we're really at a point with your direction that we are focusing on affordability and account and equity. So this budget really doesn't present anything big and new. We are continuing where our current level of service, our current the current commitments the community has made, but there are not big new asks the way there, there have been in past years. So uh, what does this actual budget process look like? Um, this is where we've been in September and October with your goal setting sessions. Uh, tonight is the overview budget presentation. Through the rest of December and January, we will do individual uh, department presentations focusing on public safety, community services, and public works, streets, sidewalks, facilities, et cetera. You will then have a meeting to have an overall budget conversation about anything you might want to see um, added to or changed. And then by that January 25th deadline, you need to um, approve the FY22 budget and set the amount to be raised by property tax dollars. And then obviously town meeting day in March. So during our goal setting process, um, we had the following conversation. The goals you set for us were to maintain current staffing levels and service levels. You know, we're, I think we as staff felt like you were saying, uh, we're, we're focusing on the right things, keep doing those things. Um, you asked us to bring you a budget that was um, at or below the cost of living adjustments. Um, you asked us to maintain our commitment in um, our capital improvement plan, um, our infrastructure investments with a specific focus on sidewalks. Um, and that if there was going to be any addition, you asked us to ensure that that focused on maintaining essential services for our residents 
um, including Thrive and Senior Services. So I think it's important to start with the, the vast majority of our budget is our people um, and who those, what those kind of service areas are. So as you've heard me say before, before we are a small full service municipality um, with um, fire and code enforcement, public works, police and dispatch, community services, planning and zoning and community and economic development and general administration. So down to the details what you all have been waiting for, for those dorky municipal people like me. So this is what we are proposing. So you see here what our current year, the FY21 year and our proposed FY22 budget. So we are proposing um, an $8.2 million general fund budget, which is um, a seven, over a seven and a half percent increase in spending. However, we are only in proposing a 0.8% increase in the taxes to be raised which means, um, which translates into us really diversifying our revenue streams and increasing the amount of non-property tax revenue we bring into the budget by 25% this year. Um, so all that translates into a 1.83% increase to the tax rate, which would translate to, uh, for the average single family homeowner to about a $47, and a $47 add to the annual property tax bill. I'm going to pause there and just say, feel free to un to jump in and ask me any questions along the way if you would like, or happy to answer them at the end as well. Um, so a few more details about what is in this overall budget. Um, as you um, may remember some of the assumptions and challenges we brought to you during your goal setting session, uh, we are assuming a 2% cost of living increase in this budget. Uh, we are assuming a 0.7% increase to the grand list, which translates into about 40, almost $50,000 of new revenue. That's a fairly conservative estimate of grand list growth. As you may remember, last year we estimated a 0.8% and actually came in at one point, about 1.5%, 1 which is what allowed us to lower the tax rate we were anticipating in FY21. Health insurance for municipal employees is increasing 3.3% this January, which is significantly lower than we've seen in past years. So we are maintaining that 10% projected um, health insurance increase in January, 2022. Um, and then we are assuming 385,000 in local options revenue, which is up from um, the FY21 budgeted amount of 355,000. Um, as you may remember, when this was first implemented, we had um, not a whole lot of receipts data on what this could bring in uh, with the change in how sales tax was applied to online purchases. Angela and I have been tracking this very carefully. And while we are seeing some shifts in local options receipts, i.e. Uh, rooms, meals, and alcohol is going is, has gone down significantly during the pandemic, sales receipts has actually gone up significantly as a result, we think, of online purchases. So this assumes um, an increase, although it is on track with what we are anticipating collecting in FY21, um, and therefore we are fairly, com we are comfortable with this projection for FY22. So um, as I said earlier, um, there are very few new ads in this budget. So I do want to call out where things have shifted for you. Um, as I said, level services for staffing. The only staff ad in this budget is the new equity director position, uh, which has corresponding revenues attached to it. So it's a net zero impact to the tax rate this year. Um, you will see in the full budget that the expense, the revenues um, for the Working Communities Challenge Grant are built into this budget, as are the expenses primarily in the um, city manager's budget. One of the big structural changes we're recommending this year is moving the Thrive Recreation and Meals Program within the Enterprise Fund fully over to the General Fund. This is a continuation of a conversation we've been having for several years about those programs um, not supporting themselves through the revenues raised, but being essential services to our community. Um, so I'm going to talk more about this in a few minutes when I get to that fund. Um, included in this budget is uh, the full 50% funding for the school newsletter. Um, it's included here is continuing our 5% um, 
increase to our capital improvement um, spending annually, uh, again, with that focus on sidewalks. I have included in this budget um, our funding for the school resource officer. Um, I call out in my memo to you all that this may be a question for you to consider as we go through this process, given the conversation the school trustees are having. Um, the superintendent and I have talked about this since I put together this document. Um, they have laid out a community feedback process around the school resource officer that they will not have completed by the time you need to approve the budget to move this forward. Um, my recommendation would be that you, uh, so you have, you have several paths forward and we can talk about this if you would like tonight or at um, a future budget hearing. Um, but given that the school trustees are likely not to have made a decision about this position during your conversations, um, I would recommend you let that public process play out and make the financial decisions you're going to make as a result of that, but that public process unrelated to this budget process. Um, and then we have con continued our incremental increases to fund the Winooski Valley Parks District and Channel 17, which are our two community partners where we are paying uh, less than the funding formula they, um, they have for other communities. So that's $1,000 each increase. So this is another way of looking at um, the general fund budget that's before you um, and how those revenues and expenses are broken out across service areas. Again, you have this in a larger version in your budget book. Um, and then, so to thus far tonight, I've talked about the general fund, but also before you is the full, all the funds budgets for uh, municipal operations. So while going back, um, eight, we're proposing a $8.2 million general fund budget. In total, we're actually proposing a $15.3 million municipal operations budget across all funds. And you can see how those are broken out here. Um, across all funds, the overall budget increase is up 1.96 from FY21. And as we look at those funds across service areas, you can see how they're broken out. So uh, the biggest portion of all of those funds is public works, uh, which does include the capital plan. So it is facilities for all the other municipal operations as well. Um, then we have our tax quadrant or our, sorry, tax increment financing district quadrant, our TIF quadrant. Um, followed by police and administration as our largest expenditures. So to give you a few highlights from other funds that you will hear more about as we go through um, our budget hearings, uh, we are in proposing to maintain the rate structure increases we have proposed in past years in our water and wastewater funds. That's 3.6% increase in water and 5 0.5% increase in the wa wastewater, which equates to about $13 a household and $26 a household. Um, focusing back on community services, the community services fund and moving out Thrive Recreation and Meals for a minute into the general fund. Um, there are two main goals to doing this. One is to fully integrate them into the general fund, given that those programs aren't self-sustaining through the revenues that they um, bring in and that we, again, have heard the priority um, of a continuing those essential services by the, by the council. Second, it protects the reserves that currently exist in those funds for the library and senior center. Both the library and senior center have healthy funds within community services, but within the community services fund um, with uh, dollars either donated or raised specifically with the intent of being used for those purposes. So if we don't move the other programs out, uh, we will now be subsidizing those programs with funds uh, meant for another service area that we want to protect. And then finally, the rental registry does anticipate the increased revenues um, to reflect uh, an ordinance update we hope to bring you in the next month or so. Um, so the just this is just a call out that we are we have continued the leverage funds report that we started last year that demonstrates um, by project the non property tax or non rate um, revenues brought that we have um, brought into projects to again keep that affordability um, for the city and those details are all in your budget book by project. I think it's always important to talk about reserves um, as we're talking about the budget, what is in our savings account essentially. 
Um, so this is a snapshot of that as of the end of June 30th, of the end of FY20, which was June 30th. So at the end of June, at the end of FY20, we have 568,000 um, in our reserve, in our unassigned operating reserves account. Um, since this uh, spreadsheet, you have allocated 30,000 of that to um, downtown Winooski, but it's still a very healthy reserve that we have available to us. And also allows for um, unanticipated needs that we may experience as a result of COVID. So what's next for you all in the general um, overall budget picture is the weekly presentations from the department heads. The final votes that you will need to take is approving the general fund budget and the warning for town meeting day, approving the individual enterprise and special revenue funds for FY22, approving a fee um, and rate resolution, and then convening as the trustees of the Winooski Development Corporation to receive and allocate funding for FY22. So I'm gonna pause there before I get into the very high level general government overview and see if there are any questions at this point or do you want me to just keep going and have discussion at the end? Keep going? Okay. So this is a general government. This part is much shorter. Just heads up, you don't have to listen to me talk that much longer. Um, so general government is how what we um, classify is all the thing, all the, uh, tasks of the city that support all the departments or support efforts that are uh, kind of without a department or cross department. So including, we include in this, the city clerk, communications, finance, human resources, equity and inclusion with the new equity director, planning, zoning, community and economic development, parking and our tax increment financing district. And you see the humans that this represents. So in this specific FY22 proposal, um, again, we have the increase in uh, our commitments to our community partners. We have the Working Communities Challenge Grant integration into this full budget, and we have the funding for the school newsletter. Those are the only changes included in the general, in the general government budget, in the general fund. So I wanna give you snapshots of um, the individual enterprise funds that exist within um, this sphere. Uh, so the first, the biggest is obviously our tax increment financing district. Our next agenda item is about this uh, in a little more detail, um, but I wanna call out for you here what we are assuming for FY22. Um, so in uh, the TIF budget in FY22, we are assuming um, the sale of the development rights for lot um, 7D or 17 Abenaki Way. We are assuming an increase of a increase of a hundred thousand dollars to three hundred thousand um, dollars in payment to the Winooski Community Development Corporation. With both of those, um, with both of those things in consideration, we are still e able to meet our one-to-one -one debt service covenant ratio, which is required coverage ratio, which is required um, for our primary debt in the TIF district. And you'll hear in our next agenda item that assuming that our community in Vermont can come out of the pandemic, um, and we do see anticipated development in the TIF district, we are well poised to, to pay off the, prime, the debt in FY24. Um, the next uh, budget I want to highlight for you is the community development budget. Um, so again, we are recommending that we increase the payment of this note by $100,000 this year. Honestly, our primary purpose for that is to, one, we can do it within the revenue models within the TIF district. Two, it allows us to free up some dollars for unanticipated expenses we may encounter in the business community or in community development um, as we come out of COVID. So as you will see uh, with this proposal, we are growing our fund balance in this fund to 384000 Also in this budget is the grant match to support our equity and inclusion work. Um, we have included a $40,000 $40, payment to the parking fund for the development of the Abenaki garage, and we're increasing our fund balance. And then the last <clears throat> fund that I want to call out um, in this section is our parking fund. And just as a reminder that the parking fund, we is one fund, we operate it as two, 
uh, because the surplus from the Cascade Garage, which is our current garage, um, is committed to uh, our, to TIF debt payment. So we keep those expenses and revenues separate in order to maintain that system. So in the On Street and Abenaki Garage Fund, um, the change this obviously level services, level staffing across the board here. Um, it does include the debt service for the Abenaki Garage. Um, and you will see reflected here um, pretty significant um, losses of revenue in FY20 and FY21. This is certainly where we are seeing the biggest financial impact of COVID. Um, and we are increasing the revenue projections from FY21 to 22, assuming we are coming out of COVID in FY22, uh, but we are not fully returning them to the FY20 rates, assuming that there is some ramp up and folks comfort with um, being out and about in FY22. We will also be bringing to you in the next, um, hopefully in January, um, many more details about the Abenaki Garage and funding models. We are working to uh, bridge the um, kind of gap between in incurring construction costs related to Abenaki Garage, but not having received the revenues yet. So we are we are working on that modeling and we'll bring that to you with parking agreements and whatnot in January. And then the other side of the parking fund, of course, is the Cascade Garage, our current garage. This is basically a level funded budget. Um, and as I note here, all of the surpluses that we experience in Cascade are pledged to TIF at this point, but with the expiration of TIF, those two funds would be fully combined. So the big emerging issues that we are tracking uh, within general government um, are obviously the COVID-19 impacts and our recovery out of COVID-19. Um, we are very focused. We had our kickoff meeting today with the Working Communities Challenge Grant team on um, working towards being a more equitable and inclusive community and city government. Um, that will, we're very excited to kick off that work, but certainly it will require a significant effort of all of us, um, a lot of learning that we all need to do and potentially additional um, things we need to consider as a governmental organization to be more accessible and equitable. You'll hear later on tonight more about the legacy campaign and our centennial planning um, working towards March 2022. Uh, we are working on um, a reappraisal process with the CLA dropping in Winooski. And then of course the, um, the continued work on 17 Abenaki Way and that the impact of that to the parking fund um, and to potentially the community um, development fund as well. So that is my presentation as I said at the kickoff to this. Um, I have the privilege of presenting this presentation, but really um, this is work that uh, our team has done. We have an incredibly talented leadership team that um, has just done, taken extraordinary measures in COVID-19 to ensure that our uh, community continued to be served, to be served as well as it did. Um, and as always, a huge shout out to Angela for whom the finances of this city would not be nearly as strong and healthy as they are. So thank you to Angela. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. And I'm gonna stop sharing um, just so for ease of seeing one another. So I just want to say, um, I'll echo your thanks to staff. I know a lot of work goes into this. And I think you all did a good job of coming up with a budget that does meet the goals that we gave you. Um, and to your point in this presentation, moves forward, existing commitments and community vision. You know, we're not getting off track. We're not asking for anything new. Um, and so for me personally, I probably have fewer questions than ever uh, in a budget year because I feel like everything in here made sense and is aligned with conversations we had before. Um, and I'm looking forward to digging into other funds over the next couple of meetings. If folks have questions on the general fund, um, obviously now's the time. If you have 
questions about other funds that we're going to speak to in the future, you're welcome to share those now so that staff know what to come back with. You also, I'm speaking on your behalf, but I'm sure you can email Jesse at any point and share those questions as well. Or if there are any specific data requests you would like to see us bring forward um, with our department presentations, we would love to hear those tonight, but you are certainly welcome to ask those at any time. Jim. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Jesse, Angela, and everyone for the work that went into this. I agree with Christine that this seemed a lot more straightforward. So I worried I was missing something, um, but it's still a big budget and a lot going on. And it's kind of crazy to think how much we're already doing. And this is uh, mostly focused on what we're doing more of or continuing to support. Um, I really appreciated the direction you're going on Thrive and uh, Senior, or sorry, and the Meals Program and Recreation. I think that's um, encouraging development for the city. And um, one, one question, and this is mostly just a um, clarification, is that you know, last year we had kind of the, this is all the stuff we're funding in this budget, and these are the things we're not. And I'm curious if there are any priorities that city staff considered, um, either because of past conversations or other reasons, and kind of set aside things that council should keep an eye on. Because I went back to that list and looked at what we were talking about last year and what we didn't fund. Um, and I'm just curious if there are any things that surfaced that we should be keeping an eye on, you know, in the next budget cycle. So I will jump into answer that, but um, as I said, the leadership team's all here, so others feel free to weigh in. Um, there, so I will be honest, when we built this budget, we were building for a level service budget. So we purposely did not go through the exercise of what are all the things we would add if we could, um, because that, what, quite frankly, wasn't the direction, nor did we necessarily think that that was um, a financially um, respectful thing to do for our neighbors. Having said that, I think we are very much looking forward to um, the conversation at next week's council meeting about the master plan goals and how we invest in ourselves over time to support those larger goals of the strategic vision and re really align our future um, financial decisions to those goals. Um, operationally, I think we all probably could come up with, you know, staff we would love to see to support general operations, but I think we've also demonstrated that we're doing pretty well with the current staff we have um, and are committed to continuing that. So I don't think that there's a big list of asks outside of the investments we need to make to further those master plan goals. Amy? Um, yes, I also had a question related to Thrive and also just want to echo what others have said so far. I think that the your presentation, Jesse, was very easy to understand and easy to follow. And I think that what you've put forward is a very fair budget. So um, just want to say thank you to the team for that. Um, if I'm remembering correctly about Thrive in particular in the past and some of the recreation programs, um, I believe we've had a conversation before that about some of the pros and cons about moving it to the general fund and some of those included this idea that we don't necessarily want to do that because we're already charging residents for some of these services so you know you have to pay a fee to take a recreation class or um, I don't know, blanking on um, Thrive also has a program fee associated with it. So almost this feeling like by charging them through taxes, it would be like double dipping a little bit with residents. And just curious if you can walk me through the thinking on how that may have changed or evolved. So my perspective on that, but also I would love Angela and Ray to weigh in here, is that that, um, that quote unquote double dipping has always happened in that the Thrive and Recreation staff were either entirely or in part always funded through the general fund. So it was never that the full accounting of the service delivery was being um, um totally made up, achieved through the, just the programmatic fees of the operations. Um, I think the, the idea here is that because the property tax dollars have previously, and this is a 
a bit of a misnomer, but kind of subsidize those programs with those that staffing, that by moving them entirely into the general fund, uh, we will still account for the operations. We will know how much revenue is coming in through program fees, how much revenue is coming in through property tax, and be able to lay out those models for you. Um, but that the, com the community is invested in maintaining those uh, service delivery lines, even if the paying revenues, the fees for those programs aren't aren't fully covering the costs of operating those programs. Um, and by moving them in, we're protecting those other reserves for the library and the senior center and not using those reserves to fund the operation of Thrive or our recreation programs. Um, the, uh, you know, I think it's a worthwhile conversation the community ha could have about if the if we want taxpayers to completely pay for all recreation programs that are only accessed by a certain number of our residents or whether we're comfortable with some fees being charged for specific programs. Certainly there are lots of programs that Raise Team offers that are open access to all. Um, and we also put into place the scholarship program last year or the scholarship policy last year. So we are trying to lower those barriers to entry for all. Um, but by moving them into the general fund, again, we're really protecting those other um, reserve balances and um, acknowledging to the property taxpayers that we are using property tax dollars to operate those other programs. Angela and Ray, do you want to add to that? Since we've yeah, so um, one of the things that we really had discussed was making sure that we keep the programming, particularly around childcare, affordable for people. And by having to increase the fees to cover the cost to provide the service, it was starting to get that it wouldn't be affordable to the people who really needed it most. And so it's balancing the amount that we're going to subsidize that with making sure that the people who need child care get it. With the proposed recreation moving into the general fund, it is actually coming into the general fund uh, net neutral for the recreation programs. Uh, we have a new recreation programs manager that we anticipate having the revenues fully fund those programs that are really enrollment based. Um, that are more at will. Like I want to sign up for creative writing. I want to take part in the soccer programs. They're not necessities. Um, and then the meals program is one where the grants that we receive from the state cannot fund the amount of the cost of a meal. Uh, they reimburse us far less than what we get from the state. Uh, so that is another thing where we want to make sure that people have food uh, that need it. And that is a worthwhile thing in our opinion for tax dollars to subsidize. I, I do want to add one comment about Angela is absolutely right about the recreation coming in in FY22 being net neutral. The caveat, which means there's no tax rate impact to bring over recreation. The caveat to that is that recreation currently has a $30,000 deficit in the fund. So at some point, we will need to determine what to do with that deficit. Um, essentially, do we use fund balance to pay that past due amount to protect the other rev the other reserve funds of the other programs? So it's not a tax rate impact, but there is additional funds that will need to come in. So I, I think for this, when we get to this presentation, um, for that conversation, it would be good to see that difference as Angela was outlining, here is what it, we would have to charge to fully cover the cost of Thrive. Um, here is what we, here's the gap in what the subsidy is for the meals program um, so that we have those dollar amounts and can understand that. Also, personally, I would like to have those dollar amounts for advocacy with our congressional delegation um, on those subsidies being too low. Sure. Are we still, uh, I'll save that for a later time, Never mind. Um, 
one thing I did want to just call out for all of us, um, you know, in your assumptions sheet, you shared like a conservative grandless growth estimate. Um, sounds like we're being pretty conservative on healthcare cost increases. Um, also on the local options tax revenue. And I just wanted to call that out. That is something that I really appreciate given that we don't know for sure what's gonna happen with the school resource officer funds. We, we really can't predict what's gonna happen with local options tax or grandless growth given some of the instability now. And so I think having those conservative estimates is a really good idea as this tax rate increase is like approaching cost of living adjustment, it seems like there's maybe some room to work with. So I just wanted to thank you for taking that approach. Mike. I have a question about the non-property tax revenues. There's a pretty, that's a pretty significant increase of 25% from last year, isn't it? And where is that coming from? Yeah, good question. So that's coming from things like the increase in the revenue projection for the local options tax. So that additional 30,000, it's coming from the Working Communities Challenge Grant grants, um, which is, you know, over 100,000. Um, it's coming from uh, things like recreation, fee. recreation fees coming over, Thrive fees coming over, those that the transition of that over, as well as a few other revenue projections that we have bumped up um, to show to, is a reflection of what we're actually seeing on the ground. Um, for example, our zoning permit revenue line was, we're, um, we've exceeded that revenue line in, for a couple of years, so we've increased that projection slightly. Um, and the budget, in your budget book, in the line items, if you go to the general fund revenue section, you can see, Mike, all of those um, individual line items. And that should be on, sorry, I should have had this on page um, 41 of your budget book. Angela, any other big ones that I left out there? There's also the grant match coming in. You'll see a, an increase in the internal transfers. So that's the grant match for the Working Communities Grant coming in from the Community Development Fund. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this is maybe a, this is a request from when we get to the wastewater fund. Um, just a discussion a little bit on the reserve, and maybe this is across all the enterprise funds. Um, just be curious what it's a pretty significant change in the reserve um, balances there, um, especially in the wastewater fund. So just a little bit of discussion when we get to that presentation on that, um, the logic behind that, and, and kind of the level of risk we're taking and lowering that much. And I guess, I don't know if this is something that Mayor, you can answer, but if the Finance Commission has talked about, because we've mentioned before in council meetings about what an appropriate level of reserve is, uh, depending on the fund, is that something that the, the Finance Commission has addressed or will address? Um, not yet. It's on, the, it's on the list of items, but not yet. Okay, thank you. I do want to note that on that reserve spreadsheet, the city does have a current policy of 30 days cash on hand. Um, that is that first column. So anything in that last column that's been depleting, that's unassigned reserves that is um, over and above the 30 days to keep us going from the end of one fiscal year through first bill collection. Mike. Yes. Um, so in perfect world, we get this budget passed the first time around. And then because of the, the coronavirus, and especially because of what we're going through right now, come this spring, if it's still spiking, 
do you have a plan B for budgets such as the pool that may not be able to open on time or how are we going to re keep that budgetary money in, inside the pool for the following year or, or pro like for, for issues such as the pool, anything, any programming, what are we going to do with that money if we don't use it? Are we, is it going to stay in those budgets for the following years or for other alternatives that we, that we need to focus on? Yeah, that's a really good question, Mike. So um, that is a council prerogative. So at the end of the fiscal year, quite frankly, once the audited numbers are in where we know where those basically like where those surpluses within service area are located, you could make the decision to allocate those reserves to that service area and keep them in that, that pod, if you will. So for example, to your point, um, for the pool, for example, keep in mind if we don't open, we see we don't see those revenues. So we see a reduction anyway in those revenues. But we have it's, we have allocated some property tax dollars to support pool operations. So if we're not able to open at all next summer, which will be hugely heartbreaking to all of us, <laughs> um, the council could decide to allocate about that. I think it's about fifty five thousand and property tax revenues going to pool operations to a pool fund or to a scholarship for pool or something like that in the future. But the council always reserves that right to do that with any surplus at the end of the year. Yeah, and, and we are still incurring some costs that were assigned for things like the pool. So one of the things that was approved as a part of the pool project was a staff person that was hired for the public works department. So that person is still being paid and, and would need to be considered when making those decisions. Okay. Well, it's kind of on the same lines as a school resource officer too. If the public and the school de de decides not to have that, that resource officer back, but then later on decides they decide they want them back. Is that going to be another council decision on who's going to be flipping the bill or is it going to be on the taxpayers? Um, well, it's always on the council and taxpayers. Um, you know, I, if, do, do you want me to talk for a minute about the school resource officer and what could play out? We can wait yeah. to that, to that night when we have that conversation. I'm just getting in the weeds a little bit. So my brain's act, thinking about all this stuff and with the uncertainty of what's going on, you know, I just, I want to make sure we present it to the taxpayers the best possible budget we can for what reality is going to end up having to happen. Yeah. So we, that's, yeah, good question, Mike. So um, we will be sure to outline in the public safety presentation that options for the school resource officer and how different, um, different decision points may play out with the budget. Um, I think what this budget presents, in my opinion, but it's it's yours to now take and change and critique and add to or what, whatever you would like to do. This budget allows us to continue our current level of operations, including the operations we had through the COVID spike this year and that we're currently going through and also frees up some dollars for unanticipated community development costs through not only the community development fund, but also through our healthy reserve balances. So if there are ad additional funds needed to support businesses or community members, that there is some kind of savings account there to do that. Um, and it allows us to do that within, um, you know, within a relatively affordable increase to the community. Um, Certainly it's not, you know, huge jumps forward in investment or new projects or new initiatives, but it allows us to maintain the status quo with a little bit of play and flexibility. Jim. This is my last one, I promise. Um, <laughs> The final piece, just on the um, Winooski Community Development Corporation uh, increase in the transfer or the repayment of that note, um, and it's, it seems like the primary motivation is to give us flexibility if we are in 
March next year, and it looks a lot like April of this year. Um, and we need to think about some kind of aggressive supports for our business community and our community in general. If that doesn't come to pass, or if there's insufficient federal and state funding to um, offset those impacts, what do you envision for the process for reprogramming those funds? Do you already have like a fallback plan or is that something that council will be looking at in March or April? Um, what's your thinking on those uh, additional funds if they are not needed for COVID? Oh, that is a great transition into the TIF conversation, in my opinion, but <laughs> I will uh, answer quickly and Heather and Angela jump in. So the CDC fund is really the, re the um, recipient of that note the TIF owes back to the historic CDC that you now all are the trustees of. Um, so that is repaying about a million dollars worth of uh, principal and associated interest. Um, so... Um, at the end of the TIF district, in theory, that CDC fund goes away, but for the caveats on how those dollars are spent, the, that, that um, debt covenant, as you may have remembered from seeing in the past, the dollars have to be spent for those purposes, which are fairly broad. Um, but over time, the council is going to have to determine how to use all of those dollars, whether it's for COVID or something else in the future, you know, one-time expenses or other similar expenses in the future. Um, so as we increase now that we free up those funds earlier, as you will see in the next agenda item, we believe we can fully repay that note by the end of 2024, which in, or FY24, which includes in that final year, an almost $900,000 balloon payment that will be additional funds for the council to program. Not tax capacity. It's not, it can't offset the general fund, but it can go to support other community development activities. So over the next three or four or five years, the council and the community is going to need to allocate all of those dollars. So this is really just accelerating the repayment and lowering the balloon payment at the end and not necessarily planning to spend that extra hundred thousand dollars within the coming year, right? So we don't need to reprogram those funds within this year, just um, if they're needed this year they're available or in FY22 they're available. Right. And actually technically it's catching up to our repayment schedule. So historically we were scheduled to make $300,000 payments a year um, and we scaled that back with the uncertainty of Abenaki and with the lawsuit about Spinner when we when we were trying to make sure we met that one-to-one -one coverage ratio. Now that the financial health of the TIF is looking better, we can resume that original $300,000 payment schedule. Thank you. Any questions or comments from members of the public? Again, you can raise your hand or use the chats in Zoom. I don't think we have any phone callers. Any other questions from council? I feel like we might be ready for the next item. So let's do it. Let's move on to item D, which is discussion about the tax increment financing district overview and planning. Um, something I just wanted to say before Jesse takes us through this is that, you know, we have this has come up from time to time in these meetings that when we pay off this debt, we're going to see this new revenue for our city and we should be thinking about this um, like future planning before you know, we get there to that date and, and we haven't done, we haven't thought this out and how it should align to our vision, community vision. And so I thought it would be nice to have this overview right now. Um, this is not meant as a time to make decisions, but to see what we're projecting, what we may have already kind of committed ourselves to, or like said, we think we'll use this revenue for. Um, what we're already using it to pay for, as you'll see some like salary expenses are already coming out of there. But also to keep this in mind as we talk, as we're moving through this, this budget over the coming weeks, you may notice like future needs. And so I want you to, to be thinking about here's what we might have in the future as you're seeing needs arise in 
you know, in our CIP and our capital planning needs or in at the end of the um, Working Communities Challenge Grant and then having to fund that. Um, and then also keep in mind just other conversations that we've had, you know, funding the Housing Trust Fund. Um, we have other capital projects that are down the pike at some point. Um, we've heard about some needs from downtown Winooski. So as you take in this information and work through our budget process, like there are a lot of different things that this revenue could be used for. And so I want all of us to be getting a broader picture of that. And then we can revisit this after we settle on our FY22 budget um, and have a deeper discussion, bring our finance commission into it. So just some context there, and I will pass it over to Jesse. Thanks. Um, yeah, so no decision tonight, just trying to give you some baseline information as you both go through this budget process, have the master plan conversation at your next meeting and uh, make decisions throughout the next couple of years. Um, and I'm not, I'm not going to go through all of this paragraph by paragraph, but um, we'll focus on the highlights. And again, thanks, special thanks to Angela for um, her work to put this memo together. Um, so first, I, I think it's really important that you understand the assumptions that we're making as we model the TIF on a um, regular basis. We This is a model that Angela and I look at probably on a monthly, quarterly, if not monthly basis, just to make sure we're on track to retire this debt. Um, so the assumptions are really important to us. So in our current model, we are assuming that we receive the full payment for 17 Abenaki Way. We're assuming $7 million of new grandless growth in the TIF district. That is a very conservative estimate for um, Lot 7D. If for whatever reason, Lot 7D doesn't move forward, uh, we might see that at um, a different development along East Allen. Uh, we have built into this model the tax rate increases associated with the school bond votes. <coughs> As you know, we, we uh, retain 98% uh, of the school revenues in the tax or in the TIF as well. This is more talking than I have done in a long time, folks. <laughs> um, on the municipal side, we are only um, modeling a half a percent increase in the tax in the municipal tax rates um, over the life of the TIF. Um, and then we are assuming we are going to continue to make the general fund transfers and we are going to fully repay our primary debt, the TD banknote and the subordinate debt of the PCOR notes and the, the CDC notes to ourselves, um, which would result in that almost million dollar payment in um, FY24. So with all of that, um, we are assuming we would end the TIF with about a $300,000 um, surplus, for lack of a better word, that likely we wouldn't be negotiating with the state on how that would break down between Ed Fund and Municipal Fund. Um, so then we include our actual current TIF forecast. Uh, we do call out what is current city operations that is funded through um, TIF revenues right now. So that is that general fund transfer to support um, downtown maintenance, fire service, police service, and some of the administrative time. And then in the note, CDC note repayment, we are funding portions of Heather, Paul, and Eric's positions, um, as well as, um, you know, grant matches and things like that. So assuming we want to continue to support those things, we have to take into consideration those expenditures as we take into consideration the revenues returning in FY25. So on the last page of this memo, we outline uh, what FY25 and beyond might look like. This is just a set of models several years into the future. So again, there's those three revenues that would be returning to the city. That's the million dollars of property tax revenue on the municipal side, the pilot payments, um, and um, our, some interest in income investment, investment income we receive. So it's about 1.5 million in total revenues. And then if you look at what are we are currently um, potential expenditures, so what we are currently funding through the TIF or, um, you know, we're, uh, keeping the what we developed through the Working Communities Challenge Grant, the Main Street investment, the remaining um, available amount minus those expenditures is about 322000 Again, these are projections into the future. Um, 
So there are almost unlimited things the council could decide to do with all of those revenues. Um, we, you know, we could invest in ourselves like we're proposing through Main Street. Um, we do periodically hear people talk about returning those dollars to the taxpayers. So I just want to did a very rough analysis of what that might mean by the grand list. So if we were to return those dollars to the taxpayers, that's just the million dollar property tax payment. You can't do that with, um, it's not the same calculation with pilot payments, et cetera. What that would mean is in that FY25, basically the tax rate would decrease because we'd have a million new dollars of revenue into the budget. And therefore in that year, property taxpayers would pay less than they had paid the previous year. Um, and we, how we have um, kind of outlined that here is looking at the grand, the grand list by land uses. Uh, so commercials, commercial properties, duplexes, industrial properties, single family homes, et cetera and used an average calculation of if we re returned that million dollars, what is the savings folks would see in that one F fiscal year 20, um, both for the million dollars of property tax in the middle column and then the far right column, if we were to return the available amount minus the continued investments that we are currently making out of the TIF district. So that's a very high level summary, again, not for any decision making, but uh, for background information over your next conversations. Angela, anything you want to add there? Angela made that last section much more useful to you than I had initially had it. <laughs> no, that, that's about what we've discussed. We're coming into the end very quickly. Well, thanks for walking us through that. Uh, I did just want to piggyback on the last piece there about if the money was returned. But the other way, the other way I've heard this discussed is that it was an investment to mitigate tax increases. And so another way to look at it could be, do we use this just to mitigate increasing the general cost increases that we see for level services even? So there are a lot of things this revenue could be used for in the future. And we should think about that and talk about more in depth and decision making as we get further out and get through our master plan goals discussions. But now is the time for questions. Amy. Can you just remind me for the main street, what ratio we're looking at, the, that number representing, is that 50% of that we've allocated? Are we at 60 now? It's percent of the, tit, so it's, a, it's all of the general fund costs um, needed in that future year so as not to have any more property tax impact for Main Street. And so it's a, it's a little over, uh, it's over 50% for just the property tax revenue returning. Um, John, do you want to say that a different way? No, I think that covers it. Yeah, I think, so we had always, when we were talking about Main Street, there's always a maximum of 50%. So I think as we've modeled it, it's right around half a million dollars um, that, that would be utilized from that funding. Mike? I got a question. I, we keep hearing two sides. Either we give it back to the taxpayers or we reinvest it. Is there a, a projection of any middle ground where it's good for the city and good for the taxpayers? Has there been, is it even possible to have a middle ground so it's good for both? Um, well, I would reframe that a little bit to say, um, when you say it's good for the city, yes, there are things we want to do, but we hope that all of those things that we want to do ultimately are good for the property taxpayers. So it's um, trying to further that agenda. But to, but to your question, Mike, that is exactly what I was trying to achieve with that um, far right column on the third page of this memo. If we returned a portion of the proceeds to the residents and then reinvested a portion into Main Street and Working Communities Challenge Grant and whatnot, what is the average return folks might see? Because I, I think because it's been so long, I don't, I don't even know if, if some of the residents are still living in Winooski that when this all processed, but I think it'd be a good gesture to have a win for the, re for the taxpayer that 
have been here through this whole experience and are waiting for the big payoff, so to speak. Um, but thanks, Jess. Yeah. So I just wanted to, to jump on that with the statement that I made earlier about mitigating increases. And so we could return money and then we'll probably raise the rate again the next year, right? So one way to look at it could be like, can we use this money to keep us from having to raise the rates for some amount of time? Jim? I, and just to kind of jump on that, I mean, I would think about, can we at least mitigate the impacts of, and we're getting into more of the discussion probably than you want to, but it, can we at least mitigate the impacts of maintaining level services, right? Like we have $30 or some odd, 30 some odd dollars that we're increasing this year. And um, on, our, on a given home, can we pay for that portion and anything extra is paid for from the TIF or from a tax rate increase? And I could see that as a, a way to kind of balance between still being able to continue to invest in new programs while also basically mitigating the cost of, of just having to keep doing the same thing, like just continuing to do the same thing always costs us more money. Very unlikely to, con to cost us less money to try and keep doing the same stuff. So I could see balancing between paying for that piece of doing what we already wanted to do, but still being able to invest in some modest new things uh, as the split between those two directions, as opposed to just, yeah, like you said, a one-time tax decrease that then goes up the next year. Yeah, so these are all different ways that we could approach this um, revenue, and that it is good to it is good to keep this in mind as we're like working through another budget cycle, seeing what needs are, um, because we are going to have to make these decisions at some point. Christine, if I could just jump in for one more second and um, highlight something I meant to highlight before, I do. I, um, I think it's very interesting to look at this data by land use type. Um, I think that there's a, always a, a big focus on, you know, mitigating the impacts for residents, which I think is very important. It is when you look at the, how it would actually be played out in property tax dollars, the biggest, the kind of biggest recipients of the return are commercial and industrial land use uh, users, which is not necessarily the intention of the council, but we can't change the property tax rate for homeowners or renters versus commercial or industrial. There's always going to be one tax rate for everybody. So I just want to call that out because when I was doing this analysis, that really jumped out at me about that, you know, a $4,000 return to one group and a $300, $400 return to another group. Heather, you have something to add. I just wanted to ask in that analysis, um, it looked to me like that was per property. So if you think about some of the um, property owners, you know, there I can think of owners off the top of my head that have 20 properties, you know, some commercial ventures that have 20 properties. So that only exponentially increases the amount of the, the ratio of that that would be going to certain people as opposed to homeowners as a whole. Right, yeah, that, that analysis is meant to be the average single tax bill for a single family home or the average single tax bill for a commercial property, not the aggregate of the, the company. Good point. Jim. Um, could we, that, so that'd be an interesting, uh, additional column on that table. Um, I think from thinking about the, could we have the aggregate, not just the average return, right? So you've taken it and divided by the number of property owners. Um, I'd be curious what the N is on that and then the total. Any questions from members of the public? Any other questions from council 
on this data and what we're looking at? All right. So again, this was just on for discussion. Before we move on to item E, I would like to call a three minute recess. So we will reconvene at 8.03. Only eight more items, everyone. All right, Hal or Jim, are you all back yet? Give them a moment. All right, we shall reconvene. We are at agenda item E um, and an update on our legacy campaign. Will Paul be presenting? Paul will be presenting. I will be introducing though. Um, okay. So, so just to um, remind all of you, we came before you back in, I believe it was January or February of 2020 with our rollout plan for the legacy campaign leading up to our uh, centennial, our hundred years uh, anniversary 
of the city in 2022. So we were all prepared with a timeline that started rolling this out in March and then COVID hit. So I am introducing tonight a much revised plan that Paul Sarn has really taken the lead and run with um, to allow us to roll out the legacy campaign in what is currently a remote and virtual environment with an eye to a future when we will be able to gather again to celebrate our centennial celebration. So I'm gonna turn it right over to Paul. He is really taking the lead with this and has done a fantastic job. So I'm excited for you to see what he's worked on. Thanks so much, Heather. Uh, I promise this one has a lot less math. No offense, Angela. <laughs> Try to be brief about it. Um, First, let me thank you for the time tonight to present you uh, this overview. Um, I thought first we could start with just a brief recap uh, to follow up on what Heather uh, just said. Um, if you remember in 2017, uh, we went out to bid with our marketing and branding RFP and awarded engaged strategies. Uh, this was a competitive process. We saw a lot of really great interest in the project. Um, in 2018, uh, Engage Strategies and their team delivered our new brand and the framework for the legacy campaign. You'll remember their CEO, Mike Bento. Uh, he presented you with their findings at the previous council meeting. Uh, we really enjoyed working with their team and we're very impressed by the whole process. Uh, in 2019, we were able to fully implement our new brand and launched a new and improved website. Uh, that was an important step in professionalizing and creating a central location for the campaign's content and the rest of our branding rollout. Um, in 2020 and beyond, we are aiming to begin generating content and standing up the Centennial Celebration Committee uh, leading up to Winooski's 100-year birthday on March 7th, 2022. So just as a quick reminder, uh, the campaign's focus recognizes Winooski as Vermont's Opportunity City and is built uh, to celebrate our 100-year legacy of welcoming and opportunity. Uh, our story as seen here is a direct reflection of the community feedback we received during the development process. Uh, I, know, I know it's kind of a lot, uh, a lot here to put on a t-shirt, but we'll, we'll figure something out. So essentially the campaign is split into two main parts. Uh, the first of which are features to highlight our people, places, and traditions through multimedia storytelling. Uh, features will include any story that highlights personal and collective experiences of opportunity and welcoming. Process will allow for people, places, and traditions to be featured through really any kind of format, uh, allowing talented community members to showcase their photos, their videos, their art, writing, you know, any, anything that really, uh, that really fits and, um, you know, stuff that the community members are, are comfortable doing. There's an infinite amount of uh, content to highlight. Uh, and we have a lot of experience already working with like students and organizations on these sorts of projects. We've seen really great creative writing essays, photography, podcasts, uh, all kinds of great stuff that you've seen um, thus far. A couple of familiar examples of obvious highlights would include things like Waking Windows, a Halloween in Winooski, uh, the evolution of our downtown, uh, and obviously the countless stories of all of our neighbors. Uh, we've compile, compiled a, a list of features to start, but uh, we'll be using a multitude of functions to showcase our cultural and historic diversity. One of those functions is to partner with local media for features. Uh, we think there's a tremendous value in their storytelling expertise and have already begun conversation um, with UVM's community news service. I'm sure you've seen the Winooski News so far. It's a really cool startup, really great project um, that works with students to sort of showcase community voices. Um, and we think that'll really help expand our capacity for storytelling and uh, just exponentially expand um, that function. Another function uh, will be to partner with organizations who can directly connect us with stories from our students and our non-English speaking residents, our seniors, business owners, and pretty much everybody in between. You can see a, a really short list of organizations there, but you know uh, just as much as, as we do that that list um, does not end and there are plenty of people to get directly connected to. I think though one of the most exciting ways to get these features is to have community members suggest them directly. Uh, features can be submitted on the legacy campaign page through a custom online form we're building out or by phone or email. Um, there'll likely be a multitude of options for people to be able to do that. Uh, you know, the whole, the whole thing there is if you have an idea or somebody you want to feature or even yourself, uh, we definitely want to hear about it. 
The second and equally important part of the campaign is to put together what we're calling the Centennial Celebration Committee, who will be planning all of the related events. Uh, committee membership will be generally open. We're hoping members of council and the downtown organization and the school district uh, will join. Really, anybody who's excited to help tell Winooski's story will want to get involved. The only guiding criteria uh, that we're sort of looking at right now for those events uh, should be centrally planned around the themes of welcoming and opportunity. We're definitely open to all kinds of event functions like exhibits and murals, public art, music performances, historic tours, virtual events, uh, or any other kind of creative ideas the community might have. Obviously for now, planning will have to take COVID-19 into consideration, just like everything else. We are optimistic for in-person events as we get through the pandemic and closer to 2022. Um, I've heard a couple times this evening, people mention, you know, what if we need to shift gears? This obviously uh, it will also be modular in a way to accommodate for that. Um, the committee will meet virtually on a monthly basis to start, and those meetings will be open to the general public. Uh, our hope is that the events planned will be a true reflection of the community and their experiences. So just to give you a visual reference of the whole framework, you can see that there are two really easy ways to get involved with the campaign, either through our ongoing features or through the committee. Uh, we're certainly hoping that people will want to get involved with both. So we're hoping to launch early in the new year uh, when the landing page goes live. It can be found uh, at winooskivt.gov slash legacy. Uh, visitors will find the overview of the campaign, upcoming features, the feature suggestion form, an interactive calendar of events, uh, and information on the Centennial Celebration Committee. Uh, you can follow along uh, and view the features as they go live by signing up for our email updates on the website where you can connect with us on social media and front porch forum as people do. Uh, we also plan to create a custom legacy section of the school newsletter. I think I made a record time this evening on a presentation. So thanks again for your time. Uh, I'm happy to open it up for questions. Thank you, Paul. I was actually thinking about this recently and being like, I wonder how delayed this is because of our inability to have public events. Um, so it's nice to see an update here. I am looking forward to this launching early in the new year and seeing what the committee and community contributions come to. There's a lot of opportunity here and also ambiguity as we see what, um, what folks have to offer. Um, are there questions or comments from council? Amy. Thanks. Um, first, I'm really excited about this campaign and I would love to be involved. So you can count me in. Um, <laughs> I recently watched a documentary on PBS um, about uh, Dan, I'm blanking on his last name right now. I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. Higgins. Yes. Thank great you. Documentary. Yes, it was a great documentary. Um, one thing that it really educated me on as a somewhat newer member of the community is the painful part of our past with urban renewal. And, you know, you probably don't have all the answers to this tonight, but I'm just wondering if you all have thought about how we might receive some of that feedback and if you anticipate any hesitancy with some of our residents who have been here a long time from maybe wanting to participate in the legacy campaign because of those kind of more painful memories. That's a, that's a really great question. I think, you know, with, with everything being couched in um, welcoming and, and opportunity, you know, certainly welcoming all experiences is the uh, goal of this project and, you know, sort of uh, taking those on one by one and seeing, you know, if there is a compelling story to, to tell there that really showcases opportunity and, and welcoming, I think, you know, we're obviously open to, to all of that. Um, you know, in the, in the time that we have sort of put this idea um, to the community and, and, and together, you know, it's been, it's been tremendous feedback. We've heard lots of exciting um, uh, suggestions and, and people have already, um, you know, they have a, a list of, of tons of people to feature. And so we're pretty excited about um, the positive feedback. That's great. Thank you. Help. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Paul, um, 
you know, it, it, it appears to me that a lot of this effort will be about storytelling and, and, and capturing stories that have been lost. Has there been any conversation to collaborate with Vermont PBS, which has storytelling as one of its strategic goals? So yeah, in that um, in that slide where you know we were talking about partnering with um, media organizations, Vermont PBS is huge. We are thrilled that they have moved here. They are now officially our our neighbor. We've partnered with them uh, uh, for through uh, a couple of different um, events downtown. Winooski also just recently partnered with them um, for the Halloween event. Uh, and as Amy pointed out, they just produced that great um, documentary on Dan Higgins. They are an, an invaluable partner. They're amazing. And we'd love to partner with them in any capacity that they'd have us for sure. Great. Yeah, you couldn't show all of the potential community organizations and partners on one slide that we have. It'd be tough. Disposal, yeah. Any other questions or feedback? Any questions or comments from the public? All right. Well, thank you so much for this update, Paul. Thank you. Uh, moving to item F, this is on for discussion, approval if we are ready job description for the new equity director position and Phoebe will introduce. Welcome. Hi. It's nice to see you. Um, so we are asking the council to approve the position description, including the title and purpose for the equity director position. Um, so I will just introduce it and share a little bit about how this position came about. Um, the job description was developed based on the Working Communities Challenge Grant Goals and Action Plan, which hopefully everybody is pretty familiar with at this point. Um, we created the role out of a clear need, um, especially after discussion with the leadership team, um, for a dedicated staff member to collaborate with the leadership team and the community on the grant work, as well as manage the grant itself. It's a large grant, um, and it's a lot of work um, that we're engaging in. So. Um, we got a lot of feedback from Winooski leadership team, as well as feedback from the community um, to develop the job description. And that specifically came from community partners who work with refugee and new American communities, as well as um, community partners who do work with those living in poverty and those who do racial justice work. Um, we also took a look at job descriptions for similar roles and um, people working in equity, diversity, and inclusion positions in other municipalities and organizations. Um, and a lot of those roles existed not so much in Vermont. Some exist in Vermont, but a lot of them exist um, regionally and nationwide. So um, there was a lot of research and kind of gathering of um, data around the major responsibilities of someone in this type of role. Um, so the general consensus after we collected community feedback was that this is a really big job. Um, and it'll be a relationship with the leadership team that's based on mutual support and also will require a lot of flexibility um, and trust building with um, the community and community partners, as well as flexibility based on continuous feedback over the life of the grant and beyond. So I would like to open it up to any questions that anyone has. Nice to see this coming on the very next agenda after we receive this award. So making progress. Um, I will just share that having participated in some of the discussions around this role in the, in the grant planning process, I think it is well reflected. Um, and I did see a lot of the outreach that you put out to our other partner organizations to get feedback on that. It was a very robust list and I appreciate that you made that effort to get that continuing input. Um, and I, I'm very comfortable with what's on here. Any feedback from other counselors or questions? Jim. Um, I'll echo that having listened to some of the discussion around the position, this really does reflect um, the kind of nexus that we need to make the, the various pieces of the Working Communities Challenge Grant work, from my perspective. 
Um, so I also acknowledge it as a huge job um, as we've just trying to interface with this uh, set of partners in a much less formal capacity it takes a lot of work. And so to formalize this is gonna be a lot of work. Um, when you've looked at, when you did this kind of comparative search both regionally and nationally, um, did you find that this uh, to overall scope of work is pretty par for a position like this? Or do you usually see this being more of like a small team? Or I guess I'm just curious if this can be embodied in one person, given we are a smaller community, but with a lot of partners. That's a good question. I think, I think it sort of was all over the place. There were a number of um, municipalities that had actually added on diversity, equity, and inclusion to somebody's existing job title um, and role. And I think that, you know, those were probably on the smaller side. Um, but I think it depends on the organization. I know that at least regionally, one one person that I um, that I actually got a lot of feedback from was Thais Chagreen, who has this role for Burlington. Um, and it's, it's very similar um, to, and I actually got a, a significant amount of feedback from her and, and took a lot from her job description and put it into this job description just because we share so much um, with, you know, Burlington from a community standpoint. So I think it varies. One of the other things that I've noticed popping up as I did the research for this was that a lot of municipalities are standing up equity and inclusion commissions. Um, and that was actually, I think, far more common than seeing this job title. Um, and I think, you know, I don't know, I think maybe sometimes those come first and then it ends up with, um, you know, an equity commission maybe recommending that an equity director or somebody with this specific job title is hired. But um, that was sort of, especially in Vermont, that was a little more common to have a specific commission focused on this work rather than a staff member. Does that answer your question? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, when I read this, um, I'm reminded of the role of Susanna Davis, who is the director of uh, racial equity for the state. And um, you know, when I when I get down to the um, to the last uh, sentence, it says this position will work closely with the Equity Council and city leadership. Um, I'm just wondering if it might be worth considering a more connected role to the Equity Council, because in the case of Susanna, she actually has a um, racial equity task force, which is a body of people that you know um, support her work. And I'm just wondering if, if it might make sense to consider how this position would be, as opposed to working closely, it, 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 it leads the Equity Council, or it's more directly involved with that work, um, and to use it as a, you know, resource of support. So that's just a thought. If I could chime in on that, since Hal, you did not participate in these discussions as a yes, <laughs> um, the. The discussions were around like this staff would be the liaison for that body would be working directly with them and receiving support from them as well. So I think what you've described sounds like what I heard in, in previous conversations. Although the language here may be a little more ambiguous. Yeah. And if I may add the challenge we have is we don't have an equity council yet. And so I think we also talked about this role as um, really helping to generate and sustain that uh, council through its first year. And I, I'm hoping that this model can be helpful for making it more likely to succeed given it's a high risk endeavor. Um, uh, if it's done poorly, then that if it is done poorly, it could be damaging instead of helpful. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that this person would be able to set that council up to then support them. How I think that's a really great idea. Mike, your hand is raised. I have a question. I see that the funding source is through the grant itself. How, what's the duration of the grant? I don't think I know that. Three years. It's three years. Three yeah, years. Three-year grant. That's great. Hundred thousand a year. Yeah. Plus. Thank you. Mayor, can I jump? Yeah, jump in. So 
I want to go back to Jim's question about the small team versus one person. And I, I do think um, it's important to call out that we, we need, a, this is a huge amount of work and we need expertise on staff. We don't have that expertise. We need somebody leading this charge and, you know, not only being a grant manager, but a, a expert and a connector. I think we as a leadership team really understand that we all have a lot of work to do as well, not only to support this person, but also to identify how we need to structurally change how we offer services um, across the city. Um, so I don't want to give the impression that um, this is for the leadership team, this is a checkbox and we hire this person and they go off into their office and do this work, that it really is the intention that this is a peer of the leadership team you see on the call tonight and that we will all be supporting the work and doing our own work in parallel. Um, so I just wanted to, it's not, it's not just one team, there's the, there is a small team that will all be doing this work. Any questions or comments from members of the public? Are there any further questions from council? Does someone want to make a motion to approve this this evening? So moved. Second. Motion by House, second by Jim. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Job description approved. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, everyone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> moving on to item G, agreement amendments with North End Studios and CIC Health to enable ongoing COVID testing. Jesse already alluded to this during city updates. Please continue. Sure. High level. Um, so one, just sincere thanks for approving that job description. It will allow us to post it faster and get it out there. And this is a huge moment of opportunity for our community. So thank you for that. Um, on this agenda item, so two main goals here and apologies that this is coming up upon you so quickly without any um, runway. This has all happened in the last probably 10 days or so. Um, so we have two main goals. One is to... Um, bring daily COVID testing to Winooski to our residents so they have the best, easiest access to that testing in a culturally appropriate way. Uh, two was our ongoing work to work with North End Studios to um, have them true up their past due rental balances for their the space they use at the O'Brien Community Center. So with those two goals in mind, what these two agreements do is um, basically take back from the North End Studios through the rest remainder of FY21, the community room, get, have the city take back control of that space, lower North End Studios monthly rent. Um, we will then immediately turn around and sublease that space to CIC Health, which is the contractor doing the COVID testing for the Depart Vermont Department of Health. So moving forward in FY21, we will get full rental payment as budgeted for North End, for uh, the OCC. Um, in order to um, move North End Studios forward, as you can imagine, they faced very significant revenue challenges this spring with um, the stay home, stay safe order and the inability to convene people and bring people together. Um, so we've been talking to them for a while about some rent forgiveness um, and how to keep them as an active tenant. So their agreement um, includes forgiving the April 2020 rent when they were really in shutdown mode and could not operate. Um, and then if they true up their remaining balance by the end of the calendar year, we will also forgive May 2020 and the um, penalties and interest that have accrued. So basically trues them up, it gives them motivation to pay as much as they possibly can right now, and then sets them on a trajectory through the remainder of FY21 to be able to keep up with the rental payments. So it's really hopefully achieving two big community goals of uh, ensuring that revenue stream and quite frankly, in my opinion, more importantly, getting daily testing into a new ski. Um, so that's the high level of summary. Happy to walk you through the math or the contracts if you would like. Um, and thanks to Ray for his help with the logistics here as well. Thank you. Um, questions from council? Amy. 
Just to clarify, the $31,000 that's owed, is that all from this calendar year from March on? Uh, yes, more or less. Yes, it is all from this year. There are some disagreements between the parties of the payments they have made in the last calendar year, what they've been paying. In their minds, they've been paying different months. In our mind, the, the newest dollar in pays the last dollar due. So we tend to allocate it back. Um, but in their mind, they just have skipped over paying for the second half of FY20. Okay, I think that's helpful for me to understand just because it shows that they were making their rent payments before COVID, right? So that's not the, it's not like this is a trend um, and it really sounds like COVID was the main contributing factor. So th thank you for phrasing it that way. They were not initially making their rent payments and then kind of caught up as COVID was hitting or like started paying as COVID was hitting and then really fell off in the in the March to June period. This fiscal year, they have started paying again. So they've started paying August, September, October, November. So they're kind of truing up now with a gap from the stay home, stay safe period. So they are paying on time now, but for this past due amount. Mike, you have a question? Yes. So, okay. So they're paying now. Does that mean they're back in operating or are they still shut down because of the uh, stay safe home order? Um, they are operating uh, to a certain extent. They're obviously not having, you know, 100 people weddings and things like that that are not allowed by the governor's orders, but they have much like Ray's team has figured out some ways to do things virtually and, and take out food and things like that. They are operating at a more limited basis. And if they sign this lease, what, what was the lease duration for, for the rest of this year? Or uh, for fiscal year 21? So this amendment only speaks to FY21, but the lease as a whole, how long does that go, Ray? It was a five-year lease. So I think there's, Angela, I'm looking at you to make a face at me if I'm wrong, but I think there's three more years after this year on the first term. Okay. Not to sound insensitive, but is the city willing to, to take on the loss if they don't make it? I mean, they're making payments now, but what happens if, if they can't get, so, get going again, full capacity, is the city willing to take the loss? So nothing in this agreement undoes the termination clauses we have in the existing mm -hmm. agreement. So if they're unable to operate in the future, we do have the ability to terminate for non-payment and okay. at least to somebody else. Thank you. Any other questions? Questions from public? All right. Do I hear a motion to approve the agreement amendments? So move. Second. Motion by Mike, second by Hal. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Big win, local daily testing. Uh, item I, another approval. This is a grant, Vermont After School Youth Council, which Ray will introduce. All right. Oh, I think we, did we miss one? I skipped one. I'm sorry. Item That's H. okay. <laughs> Safe routes to parks activating communities 2021 for Memorial Park. All right. So um, this is a grant through the Safe Routes Partnership Program, which is a national program. Um, this is obviously the Safe Routes to Park um, wing of that. Uh, it is funding for um, support of a technical assistance effort over a period of time and then eligibility to apply for um, $12,500 to support the project that you develop kind of through that technical assistance period. The wrinkle to this grant is that it is only eligible to nonprofit agencies. So we as a, a municipality can't apply. However, we've built a partnership with the park district, Municipal Valley Park District, um, who is willing to act as the fiscal agent um, for the grant. So we just wanted to come here tonight and really get council's blessing to sign off on a letter of support because this is gonna be work directed towards a city owned park 
Um, but the funds for this grant will not hit our, our books technically. So we just wanted to get the, the sort of green light from council to move ahead with the project given that it will impact Memorial Park. Um, and again, for folks who didn't get a chance to read the cover sheet, we are looking at um, improvements to wayfinding, um, trail development and connectivity for that park, um, which is a pretty, as we saw in the parks tonight, pretty underutilized um, park to date. So I feel like we just approved the open space parks master plan, which specifically called out these things. So way to go on quickly taking action on those recommendations. Are there any questions or concerns from council on this? I have, I have a quick question. Does the sure. VFW, is the Memorial Park, is, is that by the VFW? Can you tell me nope. what it is? Yep, sure. It's the um, it's the natural area down behind what's affectionately known as the carpet factory. So it's oh, where yeah. the CBD processing plant is down there. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yep, yep. no problem. That would make sense though, Mike. Mm -hmm. Actually, the name of that park. Um, any public comment? All right, do I have a motion to approve the safe routes to parks? So I'll move. Second. second. <laughs> motion by Mike, second by Jim. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. And now we're on to Vermont After School Youth Council Grant. All right, and here's one that we are coming to uh, asking for forgiveness versus permission. Normally we would like to come to you ahead of time before we apply, but this grant came at us pretty quickly um, since our last council meeting and we applied um, and we're really fortunate actually to be awarded um, the grant. So it is a grant that's gonna run through June 30th of this year. It's um, the $9,000 total grant, um, which will be $4,000 to go towards stipends for um, youth participating on a youth council, and then $5,000 that that council will subgrant out to community projects that youth are um, kind of developing and voting on through a participatory budgeting process. So this really checks a box that we have talked about for a long time of figuring out a more formalized way to get youth engaged in the work that we are doing. So we are very much hoping that this will be, you know, something we start with library and recreational programs and, and have these youth kind of helping to advise on the development of some of those things, but then could see this parlay into future ways of getting more youth engagement at, in other parts of the city, which I think would be really exciting. Um, you know, I know we've talked a lot about commissions. I think that's an area where it would be great to see this kind of push into. So um, we were very excited. I got to give Kate Nicoletti um, accolades here. Vista. She, this is her first grant application that she sort of took a lead on and had some great support from myself and Nate and Jenny, um, but did a great job and one for one. So, um, Mike, your hand is raised. Hey, um, what, Ray, what's the age groups? Um, so we are going to, I think, be figuring that out somewhat with the Vermont after school um, folks. There's not anything listed in the grant materials, but as we're looking at it, we're thinking um, grades 6 through 12, so middle and high school age. Um, and the idea being that we'd have a smaller number of younger kids that we could sort of groom up into leadership roles over time with um, support from some older kids. So we're thinking of trying to cover that middle and high school spread. Um, and we're going by grades here because ages for us sometimes are a little bit um, off from kind of traditional ages because of folks arriving here and being at different um, levels of language acquisition or educational attainment. Right, but they will be chill. They will be kids. They, uh, I mean, under twenty, right? I mean, I think I yes, I think we yeah, will yeah. be focusing on on younger people, young That's, adults, and kids. I'm excited for this. This is great. I think. Yeah, it's it's an exciting program for sure. Any other questions? Uh, public comment? All right, would someone like to move to approve the Vermont After School Youth Council Grant? So I'll move. Second. second. Motion by Mike, second by Amy. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries, forgiveness granted. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next up is item J, another grant. This is TD Green Space, and John Rauscher will introduce. Thanks, everyone. Um, special thanks to Councillor Duncan for his work to date on this grant um, and, and really bringing it to our attention. So um, 
if I if I miss anything, feel free to jump in, Jim. Um, so this request is for grant authorization to apply for a TD Green Space Grant in the amount of up to twenty thousand dollars. There's no match requirement for this grant, um, and and this is associated with the Arbor Day Foundation. So you might remember we um, we became a Tree City USA. Arbor Day Foundation is, is the group that sort of administers that program. So the purpose of this grant funding is to support, um, this is taken right from them, green infrastructure development, tree plantings, forestry stewardship, and community green space expansion to advance environmental and economic benefits. So, uh, and with that, the theme of this year's grant is building resilience, green infrastructure solutions for communities disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Um, so we're, you know, as Mike mentioned earlier, we're, we're positioned pretty well for this grant, um, given that we are Tree City USA, um, and this grant does uh, treat low to moderate income communities as um, preferred. Uh, so we do have sort of a leg up for this application. Um, and then as far as the scope of this grant, um, Councillor Duncan and the Tree Committee, um, they put together some options to review, um, which I've listed in, in the memo. Um, so besides your typical tree planting options, um, we're looking at potential planning and program support for things like shade tree planting, emerald ash borer, programs, uh, tree stewardship programs, um, and there's a few other kind of focus areas that are in that memo. We ran this by the Municipal Infrastructure Commission too to get some feedback on. Um, they seem supportive of pretty much everything that, you know, all the options that we presented. Um, and this grant application, it's due December 18th, I believe. So uh, pretty quick turnaround to get that in. And then all work pretty much has to be done um, by this time next year. So any, you know, we couldn't apply this to say like Main Street or something like that, where it's, you know, future future construction, it's it's a quick turnaround. So um, Councilor Duncan, if I miss anything, um, feel free to jump in, but that's that's pretty much the, the gist of this grant. I will only say that this grant is only available to us because we became Tree City USA, and that's like the, it makes us really competitive in Vermont because you can't even apply unless you meet certain criteria, and we're one of uh, less than a dozen communities in the state that meet the criteria, so we really are competitive, and um, having TD Bank in town, I think, helps a little bit, so. Any questions from Council? Hal, did you? I saw you go off mute. No, I'm sorry. No. Cool. <laughs> Mike, you also unmuted. I was just waiting to vote. Oh, um, <laughs> let me just say then, any public comments? All right. Would someone like to move to approve the TD Green Space Grants application? So moved. Second. Motion by Jim, second by Mike. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries a note to other counselors, follow Jim's lead, find us grants. <laughs> Actually, I feel like Hal may have also done this for us in the past, so. Um, item K, housing stability update with Heather that Jim gave us a headline for earlier. Yeah, um, I am not going to go through this. This is the quarterly report um, of the housing stability indicators that I look at just to give us an early detection system for if we are looking at something like an evictions cliff. What I do want to add is that, as Jim mentioned, we had a couple major property owners um, come in to speak with the Housing Commission as part of our review of the housing stability information. And between the two of them, it's over the two uh, people who came in, it's over 300 units that they represent. And between them, they said that there was exactly one tenant that they were looking to evict. And the person that is in that situation is someone who maintained their job throughout, but simply stopped paying rent in March and hasn't paid since. Mm -hmm. And 
has not responded to any outreach or attempts to assist them. So there is one eviction that they were aware of that would be going forward. But generally what we're seeing um, based on this data is that we are not on an imminent evictions cliff. Um, but I will say this, uh, I'm seeing that more people have been able to pay their rent um, over the period considered here. Part of that may be because Vermont used our CARES Act funding in really useful ways with the rental housing stabilization program, with the mortgage assistance program, and those programs are about to run out. Um, so I would say that overall the systems that were put in place have been working, but we are seeing growing concern and less confidence among renters that they'll be able to pay their upcoming rent, despite the fact that more people were able to pay over this period. And I think in part, the uptick that we're seeing in COVID obviously raises concerns for people that there may be shutdowns, furloughs, et cetera. So still very much worth monitoring. But between having the two property owners come in and having Deke from the Winooski Housing Authority speak with us, we are not overall seeing an increase in evictions coming at this point. But we'll continue to do these um, monitoring reports every quarter. I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you for the overview. Questions from council? Jim? Uh, I, this is mostly just to kind of reinforce that point around, I think my takeaway from hearing these stories is that what was done worked and all of those supports are no longer, are gonna be gone by the middle of the month. Um, so we know we heard about the enhanced un unemployment benefits, the payments to households, the CARES Act funding. Um, and those are all kind of sunsetting. So, uh, and also the discussion of the housing commission centered around the fact that housing is usually one of the last things to get cut from your budget. So as we see meals on wheels, reliance go up, food shelf reliance go up, um, that this is going to be the, the trailing indicator and not the leading indicator. Um, so I thank you, Heather, for continuing to compile this data on a regular basis. I think um, I'm glad that we're keeping an eye on this. And it was somewhat unique among our gathering of housing commissions to have Winooski taking a proactive monitoring role. So I just want to appreciate that as well. Um, yes, I think that that takeaway is really important to consider if there isn't more uh, federal action and more funding available, um, we could be having a different discussion. And I'm glad that we will be able to, you know, look at this again next month and, and keep on keep on on top of things. Any other questions? Any questions from the public? Well, thank you, Heather. Um, and we will move to our final item L, a 2020 plan report out. Uh, Jesse can talk to us some more. Sorry. Uh, so I won't really. Um, the only thing I do want to draw your attention to here that I did not, I failed to mention city updates is that we have reconvened weekly um, huddles with VDH, the city of Burlington and our community partners as the COVID numbers are um, increasing to, to just make sure that we are all coordinated on messaging, translations, testing sites. Um, out of that came our daily testing site here in Winooski. So I just wanted to circle back to that and make sure you all knew that we were doing that. Um, happy to answer any questions on about the updates on here. Again, the new text is in red, um, but much of it you have heard about tonight. Any questions from council? Also glad to hear that those huddles are reoccurring given the situation. Thank you for sharing that. So I just had one thing to bring up and that's, I think when we, you, you worked with staff to put this together, we had had this sort of discussion that this would be in place for maybe six months and then we would have our regular priorities and strategies discussion at a you know bigger picture level. And it is just feeling to me like that that is not appropriate anymore. And like, this is what we're working with for the rest of this fiscal year. Um, because the situation hasn't improved, right? So just wanted to pulse check that with everyone else here. 
Definitely agree. I think from staff's perspective, we feel like this is a good summary of our priorities. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm not sure much would change if we revisited it at this point. Any uh, public comments? All right, any last thoughts or questions on item L? So this brings us to the end of tonight's agenda. I would take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion by Mike, second by Jim. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries, meeting is adjourned and thank you all for your time this evening. Thank you. Everyone, thanks. Bye. Bye now.